Well, what do you even say about this podcast we're going to do today, folks? Aside from... Okay, now I'm ready. Ladies and gentlemen, how the fuck is everybody? Welcome to the QTR Podcast. This is QTR. Before we get started today, I want to remind my listeners that this podcast is brought to you by the kind people that are patrons of this podcast. That means that they sign up through Patreon and donate a monthly recurring sum to help support the podcast. I am going to shout out some of my patrons. I'm going to give you the rules for today's podcast, and then we're going to get started with Cornell Professor and my personal friend, Mr. David Collum. So much to talk about today. First and foremost, let's talk about who makes this podcast possible. My friends over at the Sang Lucci Steam Room. Sang Lucci and his buddy Charlie Bathgate run Sang Lucci. And my brothers over there run something called the Steam Room, which is a live daily chat room that basically offers up alerts on big money coming in and out of the options market as it happens on a daily basis. If you are a trader, it is an invaluable service. That I recommend. These guys are the OGs. Hey, Wall Street Jesus and Sang Lucci, they coined the term call sweepers, put sweepers. These guys were at it 10 years ago before following options flow was a way to invest. They've been doing it arguably longer than anybody. It is a great way to try to telegraph how things are going to go in the equity market. And it's a great tool if you're a day trader. So check out my friends over at the Sang Lucci Steam Room. In the podcast description, I link to that and also the 3LT Playbook, which is their playbook for how Lucci turned himself into a seven-figure trader, as well as the Sang Lucci Master Course, which is a great piece of investor education that is well worth the money for my dear friend and trustworthy individual, Mr. Sang Lucci himself. Speaking of trustworthy individuals, this podcast is also supported by and brought to you by my friend, Pete Hedgetus over at The Trader's Path. The Trader's Path is a relatively new investing service. If you are a day trader, probably an invaluable service. They give you on the daily watch lists, live streams. They trade in green markets. They trade in red markets. They look at the options market. They look at the equities market. They always have an idea for what the trade's going to be. For instance, today we're talking about the coronavirus, and I see Pete is on Twitter right away right now talking about all different names that can benefit from a global pandemic. Kind of an oxymoron, but the reality of the situation is there are stocks that will go up in a pandemic. Pete, I can tell, already has a bunch of them listed because he just sent me a message on Twitter, and uh, he's just on the ball. They're a great community of traders and well worth checking out Uh, comparatively priced to other services not only are they cheaper but you're going to get less bullshit and you know that the people running the service aren't out to screw you they're actually out to help you so check out the trader's path Um, my friend Pete Hedget is over there who is a longtime supporter of the podcast and a generally wonderful person this podcast is also brought to you by my friends at rumor hound if you are a day trader in addition to great tools like the sang lucci steam room and the trader's path RumorHound is another great tool to have in your tool belt. What does it do? RumorHound tracks potential merger and acquisition rumors as they occur. So not only is their Twitter feed at RumorHound going to give you rumors as they happen in real time, it's a great account to have on push alerts, but also their service uses a proprietary algorithm that looks into all M&A rumors as they happen and it looks at a proprietary set of variables as to what the viability of a potential transaction could be and it spits out a recommendation to you, the trader, as to whether or not a merger or acquisition rumor is something you should be paying attention to or something you may wanna ignore. So again, if you're a day trader and you trade the headlines and you trade the rumors on the daily, RumorHound is a great tool to having your tool belt. The link to them is also in the podcast description. I also want to shout out my longtime supporters that make this podcast possible. Corvus Gold, Monero, Jay Mintzmeyer, Russ Valenti, Nicholas Parks, Nathan Michaud at Investors Underground, Chris Bede, Ken R., Chris Boas, my homeboy Crichton Titus, Ken, J.K. Cunningham, Stank Love, Brainerd Ferguson, my buddy Matt Merle and Jameson Trinker, thank you. Some of my newest patrons, people that have recently signed up, I want to acknowledge them as well before we get started. First and foremost, I want to shout out my friend David Hansen, uh, my buddy Joseph Vallone, John Hurd, Noah Weikert, and Adam Kazette. Thank you for your recent patrons, Scott Nelson and Albert Braden. Uh, Big Wall Street guy, I see you too, brother. 
Elliot Blotch and Marco Vitti still with me. Thank you guys so much. Finally, some people that have been with me, supporting me for a while. You got to have faith is in the house. Tyler Bonneman is still in the house, which I appreciate. How about Andrew Lindner? Thank you, my friend. Glenn Tung is still here. Junior Alexander or JR. I don't know what it is. William Sumfest, Ned DeLorme, John Phillips. Thank you guys so much. Uh, Trinker and Jim Tilton. I appreciate you guys. Flo Algo, you guys are still with me. All right. Two rules for this podcast, especially today, given what has gone down over the last 48 hours, folks. There's always a two drink minimum on this podcast. You know it's going to be a good one when I crack my beer right at the beginning of the podcast, which I don't normally do, but today had to be done. So I got my cold one in front of me and hoping you have one of your at least two minimum drinks in front of you. But as I always say, hey, two is the minimum. Some people like to do a little bit extra and we're all right with that, folks. Finally, I'm not a financial advisor. I hold no registrations and no licenses. This podcast is not financial advice. Do your research elsewhere. Pretty much don't listen to anything that I say. Otherwise, as Brandon DiCamillo said, you'll suffer the consequences. <laughs> That's right. On the line with me today is a dear friend of mine that I have anointed an economic commentator. It's not in his actual bio, but it's in the one that I use because my podcast, my fucking rules. And uh, his actual bio is uh, David Collum. He is a Betty R. Miller professor of chemistry and chemical biology at Cornell University. Ever heard of it? It's a small community college in New York somewhere. Uh, He holds a PhD, a Columbia University master's, a Columbia University another master's. Jesus, David Collum has many years of post-high school education. We'll leave it at that. How are you today, sir? I'm good. Thanks for um, reaching out again. I was going to read your economic uh, your educational credentials off, but I felt like it could take hours. There's so many of them. Uh, you know, the reason there's so many is because uh, I was told at the time that uh, Columbia got gets on my $2,500 subsidy for every degree. So they gave me literally three degrees in three years. Wow. So Yeah, so you have two, you have two master's degrees? Two masters and a PhD in three years. That was that was, uh, was racking them up fast. Yeah. What are your masters in? Uh, there, one's called a master of arts. One's called a master of science. I have no recollection of actually receiving them until I got my my final diploma and uh, discovered that I had both masters. Ah. It's just yeah, right. But there was no moment that I didn't write a thesis for either masters or anything like that. Interesting. And wh- is it actual? Is it is it biology? Is it chemical biology? What are they? Oh, it's or- organic chemistry. Oh, yeah, organic all, chemistry. It's all one big swath. So I got to Columbia and then a couple years later finished. And your PhD is organic chemistry as well? That's true too. I have a degree in biology as a, as an undergrad. I was a genetics minor, at least until the last semester, which point I did some shenanigans to uh, swap some courses. I think my technical concentration is biochem, but um us genetics for seven semesters. So given all of that, uh, it's safe to say that you are probably slightly more familiar with what the hell is going on here than the average person. Well, even the I, even I, the person that's educated. I saw the average person today wandering around in ShopRite buying, you know, single packs of Kraft cheese. And I don't really think people have any clue what's going on just yet. Well, I think I can beat the ShopRite guys. My uh, my <laughs> biology my biology degree is forty years old, so and I, I really didn't do any biology after I graduated from from Cornell. So I, I, yeah, I you know I sit there occasionally and see bio seminars and stuff, and uh, I ponder it. But it's it's uh, it's it's I'm not a chemical biologist, put it that way. All right. Well, neither am I. So this should work out great. We should have lots to talk about. I'm sitting here watching the market, Mr. Collum. And uh, as we know, the the Dow uh, and the S&P were off like 3% yesterday. The Dow, I think, closed down in the quadruple digits, in four digits. And today, uh, Dow's down about 900. So uh, some people that haven't gotten the message that something's going on in the world uh, are likely going to be getting that message today after the CDC's... uh, interesting press conference as well we haven't had you on since the coronavirus stuff has started so why don't you start from square one and let us know what the hell you think 
Well, I'm looking at the Dow. It looks like they tried to rally it. They, who's the they, right? I say they, who knows, robots. Um, here's the funny part of the story about two months before the coronavirus broke. I, I read a book on the Black Death, which is not that rare for me because I read books on the Black Death occasionally. It's a fascinating period in history for me. And, uh, and then I started watching some YouTubes on immunology and vaccinations and stuff like that. So and I was chatting with a biochemistry, a close friend of mine, um, who's now department chair. He was my associate chair. And I was asking him questions about vaccinations and how they work and stuff like that. And then the coronavirus showed up. So I, there must have been a spidey sense or something. Something was getting in my head and saying, start thinking about vaccinations. I really don't know any more than anyone else. I mean, the guy you ought to get on your show is Chris Martinson, actually. Yeah. He won't drop the F-bombs that you and I can, but he, he knows a lot more. <laughs> I've watched his YouTube videos. They're extremely informative, and I would encourage my listeners to watch his videos. Uh, Dr. Chris Martinson, he's a Ph.D. in virology, right, from Duke. Is that correct? Well, it's called pathology, but it's not pathology in the medical sense. It's pathology in the um, you know pathological uh, little critter sense, so. Got you. All right. So what do you think, Colm? Is this the uh, Black Swan event? Well, you know, I watched it really carefully. And, you know, like anything that starts at one, which is the, you know, patient zero, patient one, whatever you call them, um, it starts out slow and the numbers are not scary. And then uh, I, I can't say at some point I'm going to do a little bit of a deep dive because I can check my emails and find out when I first started swapping war stories with people. But uh, uh, but I was watching it and it was clear something was happening that was not totally normal. But right. you couldn't say it was any different than SARS or MERS or any of these other ones. So uh, so it, it was just kind of I'm watching it in the background and then uh, it, it was really China's response to it that that sort of alerted me. I said, holy shit, these guys are not treating it like SARS and MERS at all. Right. And so that's when it reminds me of, you know, like the Epstein's or any of those things where where somehow you pick up this pulse and you go, okay, this is a story that's worth worth pondering. So uh, so I started reaching out to people and over the, the months, what is it about, it's, it's just, suppose he started December 4th. Um, there are some people who think it started well before that. There was some Chinese military lockdown about 20 days before the fourth that uh, that some people think might be tied to it um, but that's just why wow. here's here's a disclaimer for everyone who's listening to the show whether I say something or whether you say something we don't have a goddamn clue what we're talking about right really. there's just there's just so many things so many speculations and that's why I've been reaching out to so many people to try to find out what they know what they don't know you know what makes sense so I've I've gotten information from virologists about what are the odds that it's actually man-made and stuff like that so um, so but we don't know anything we really don't know squat and that's what's amazing about it actually well, we got a lot of things that we need to unpack here, the first of which is China's response. You know, I've been saying for weeks, knowing what I know about the Chinese government, which isn't much, I'm not an expert, but in dealing with a lot of U.S. listed China based frauds over the last half decade, I've gotten a feel for the ethos out of that country, which in my opinion, again, it, the government is far more interested in optics than they are in telling the truth, in my opinion, and also... Their response was not congruent with the numbers that they were giving us. You don't quarantine 400 million people because, you know, a couple hundred people got infected. I mean, it was a nuclear response to what they were describing as a very small problem, right? Yeah, so the metaphor, the analogy with Chernobyl seems very real, where the information flow out was almost non-existent. The West was getting hints of radioactivity coming across the mountains, and and the Russians were saying nothing to see here, right? But the there were there were there were indications that something bad had happened, and so I think that's what the China's China's response was pretty aggressive. One could argue to their credit, right? One can argue that they that that they responded exactly as they should if they knew that a bad virus was on the loose. And so, uh, uh, so I'm not critical of the early response. I do think, uh, when it's all said and done, we're going to find out that, that there was a non-statistical death rate of dissidents. 
<laughs> I think, you know, if I were put it this way, what's his name? What's the guy, the, the, the premier's name? Jin Ping. Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping, yeah. He, uh, I imagine he will not pass this opportunity to clean up his 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 minor problems floating around the the country. So no, he wouldn't I, want to I, be on his bad side right no. now. You might you might get uh, the the old virus. It's it's interesting too. I have a I have a friend uh, that I see actually a professional that I see that's a Chinese national um, <clears throat> who I see you know every probably like every week or every two weeks and. I saw her a couple of weeks ago and inquired with her uh, because her family is still in China, but they're on the west side of China. So they're far from Wuhan and Hubei province. And I asked her a couple of weeks ago, you know, hey, is everybody all right over there? Like, what kind of vibe are you getting out of China? Because, we, you know, we have good candor, the two of us. She said, oh, you know, not the problem. Just wash your hands a lot. You know, it's okay. It's no problem. And I saw her again uh, a couple of days ago and her tone had changed. You know, because the, the first thing I said to her, I didn't even bring it up. I said, how's it going? You having a good day? And she said, eh, you know, I said, well, what's the problem? She said, you know, just worried about worried about China, you know? And I was like, ah, interesting, you know? So I think the information flow coming out of the country is very slow. I think we're going to look back in a couple of decades on this. And I think the res- the... I think the actual series of events and the timeline as it happened and what has actually happened here, I think, is going to surprise the shit out of a lot of people. And it's going to be dramatically different from what we've been told. Without speculating as to what happened, I just get this feeling, just get a bad feeling. I get a feeling like... It, so, so you probably get the feeling that we're off by decimal points in terms of the, the numbers. Well, I feel for certain that, you know, China might be. Um, well, I, I I have faith that the West is reporting what they know. I mm-hmm. don't have faith that the West knows. So I, I think that we've done something like 450 tests within the United States. Right. And, you know, that might be a rational number, but um, but but there's something like 50 cases here now. And so yeah. they, they've tested, uh, you know, approximately nine times, uh, nine times as many people as cases. Uh, that doesn't seem profoundly aggressive to me. Um, um, I would think that if you found one active case, that the people around them would, you know, be tenfold the number of people you ought to be checking. Right. Right. So, so I don't know what we're doing. Uh, I, I I've I've been having these epiphanies lately. So the, one of the first things that I got an email from our buddy Einhorn. Um, partially because he knows I, I ride this crap like crazy. <laughs> he says, I know I know you're paying attention to this. What, what do you got? And, and I sort of sent him a quick synopsis of what I had. But uh, it, it really reminded me that I don't have much. Um, and then there was this this um, this Chinese uh, exiled billionaire named Guo who Kyle Bass interviewed uh, in his secret private airline hangar. Uh, it was just, that was just about China at the time, and then Guo started going out there um, and and saying that that the China's pandemonium and that the death toll is humongous, that there's crematoria running, you know, something like 24 crematoria running 24/7. I've seen articles that say they've burnt them out. There's some that have have, have fried the circuits of the crematorium, whatever that means. Uh, so I reached out to Kyle and said, uh, you know, do you trust this Guo guy? And and Kyle certainly didn't blink in in, in terms of uh, in terms of not trusting Guo. So, um, I, you know, again, Kyle has a horse in the race in China. I know the Chinese from things he said. I know the Chinese hate his guts, and uh, and so so it's very hard to you know. So I trust Kyle's connections in China. Um, but uh, and then I reached out to um, uh, to Stephen Roach, who's real good with the numbers about economics, but but I don't think he's watching the virus as much as just you know sort of GDP metrics. And he seemed to be scrambling to get up to speed. So I really got this feeling that nobody knows. And then uh, and then uh, uh, the guys have been putting out some serious numbers, and I've had some exchanges with behind the scenes it was just Jim Bianco 
and he seems to be one of the more apocalyptic uh, macroeconomist types where he, he seems to uh, uh, see the, the supply, which is what got me real interested in why, why talking to Jim made the most sense was that he, he sees the supply chain problem, which immediately hit me. The minute China starts shutting industries, they go, that's a problem, right? right. And, this is, and, and they talk about the forward-looking markets. And I'm thinking, dude, if markets were forward-looking, the first thing they do is sell like crazy. Because you... You know, one of, I asked rhetorical questions on Twitter to see what kind of response I got. But I said, you know, how many parts are there in a car? And the answer is thousands, right? And so, so I said, how how many of these parts are made in China? And the answer is every one of them. <laughs> and then you say, and and how many parts of these parts are optional? And the answer is none. And so you've got this profoundly, profoundly statistically impossible situation where you could actually put together a car from the parts that are not being created. And then I, then I immediately translate that over to drug discovery and drug development. And uh, this is something I know more about where if you look at a, the typical drug, now there are some that are real simple. That, that there's literally a drug they charge a lot for that, 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 that you can buy by the jug for about 10 bucks and it's a drug, it's the most amazing thing. But uh, but but the, the the longest synthesis ever done of a drug is 53 steps, and in those 53 steps, there's probably uh, there's probably a thousand chemicals that have to be used, all the way from the solvents to the various catalysts to the various things, and so so I, I, I maybe it's not that many, it's it, but it's a, it's a it's a ton, it's probably not that many, but it's a lot. And and the, we outsource all of them to China, some to India. But I read an article that says India is getting their feedstocks from China, and so you have these intricate uh, chains of connections for which one break in the chain. If you're missing one of these reagents, you don't make the drug. And the specs within the United States for these drug syntheses are sufficiently high that that if let's say Pfizer's got to get something from China and China can't provide it I, Pfizer doesn't just get on the phone and say hey send us a couple of gallons they can't they can't they, they've got to make sure that their source is providing good stuff and they they have very detailed specs and they have to clear suppliers and things like that so so i think the the drug um Syntheses are are also this fragile uh, series of links where all you got to do is break one link and you got a problem and and China's breaking links in front of our eyes. So, and what I don't know is how how much is lurking in the chain right now that can work its way through. Right? How much how much how much dead volume is in the hose before the hose runs dry? And uh, I just don't have any feel for that. I do know that when I got my my wife has tremendous numbers of health problems, really catastrophic levels actually. And 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 when we go to the pharmacy, she might be getting a generic, and they'll switch generics because they they couldn't source it from the first supplier. Next thing you know, you're using a new pill, uh, new bioactivity in some cases, and and also some you know 85 year old guy is all of a sudden got a new color and they, their pills don't make sense to them anymore. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a, but that's how the system works. You get, you, you find they've switched suppliers because they had to source a different place and you shut down China. And I think, I think, I think I keep asking my pharmacist every day, is there something you can no longer get? Are you having sourcing troubles? It hasn't hit yet in my pharmacy. That's, that's the only data I have. Yeah, it will. Uh, unfortunately, I, I think, think it's, so. it's an inevitability um, you know, a couple of no one can get masks. By the way, the masks. Well, that, are, that's what I was going to bring up. You know, the CDC yeah. says today that they would need 300 million of them for U.S. healthcare workers to deal with this. And right now, we have a stockpile of 30 million, and they're all being made in China. Um, and, and by the way, you've got a billion people in China. Every one of them wearing a mask. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Right? How many masks can you make when? So, 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 so the the just in time inventory system, which is brilliant example of efficiency uh uh it doesn't have uh the capacity to quadruple or increase tenfold anything in the world right it's you you don't have factories sitting idle waiting in case you need more masks right 
and well, and so they're then, off the shelf. So my dentist can't get them. And you know what you need is you need the masks to be handed out to people who have to have masks. I'm supposedly having surgery next week. It's a trivial surgery, but I do want the guy wearing a mask. Yeah, of course, naturally. And I tell you what, you know, not for nothing, but several weeks ago when the idea first came up of, hey, maybe you want to go out and get a couple of masks, you know, you were just looked at like an asshole. You were looked at like a conspiracy theorist, like a, you know, like... Well, some, I wouldn't like, even bother. Like a I, fear I haven't monger. bothered to get masks. We might even have them in our stock room downstairs for all I know. I haven't bothered to go down. <laughs> but it's just, it's one of those situations where... You know, people are, I think now, you know, I said to my mother today, now that the Dow's down a thousand points two days in a row, some people will catch notice. People will notice that first before they notice what the CDC's comments were today. And then from there, they'll try to figure out why they're losing money. Then they'll go to the CDC's comments. I mean, I thought the tone of the CDC presser today was arguably, you know, they came out and, and used the words say that it could be a very severe spread in the United States. I mean, those are some... Those are some big words that I don't think still even now have sunk in yet. And I blame... So I don't think they can stop it. Uh, it, 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 it reached the point where I said, okay, they haven't contained it. And I think Chris Martinson gets this right where he says, look, it, it's way past containing. It, right. It's, and I, today on Twitter, I posted a couple of pictures. One was a picture of New Delhi. And it's just, it, it makes the cruise ship look like spacious, right? you know, <laughs> yep. spacious uh, accommodations. And then a picture of Mexico City where it's just this rolling hills of, of little houses jammed together. And, and when, it, when, when this virus sets its hooks into places like this, uh, oh, what's going to happen? Well, someone said, well, they've been swimming in the Ganges, so these guys are immortal. And I realize that's true. That probably the that's not a bad point. Who's swimming, <laughs> who's swimming in the Ganges? Probably thirty percent by weight antibodies, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a, it's a, so they're not bubble boys. In fact, that may be that may be important, and maybe it won't rip through the the, the really sort of grimy zones of society as well, because because these guys are built built with you know immune systems of steel. I don't know. Knowing what you know about. Um, chemistry and biology and I don't know if you've looked into this in depth so feel free to just pass on the question altogether I mean do you have a gut kind of feeling as to whether or not you think this may be man-made or whether or not it's you know natural well I've tried to get at that question uh, by asking people and I got an answer as recently as yesterday so I asked a a biochemist friend of mine who who's interested in this stuff he kind of he and I occasionally chat. He's not as wackadoodle as me, but he, he, he listens to me. And uh, he reached out to a virologist, and the virologist seemed more matter-of-fact. There were a lot of, we don't know this, we don't know that. But there's kind of a matter-of-factness. But what was interesting was the matter-of-factness. You were left with the sense that he was showing that he was a virologist, not an epidemiologist. And so it looked as though he, he he was, you know, if you focus on virology, you're not focusing on what happens in Wuhan. You're focusing on what happens with some RNA molecule inside some virus. And so you don't necessarily get the big picture. He certainly might not have a clue that masks are in short supply. So it, it's very few people. Well, what did he trying. conclude? Well, he said that he was talking about a fatality rate that sounds tame when you say something like three percent or something like that but but three percent means that one in 30 year friends are going to be dead right and that's a lot of people and 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 the this number i saw that was i've been watching so there, there's this number that a lot of people watching where it's the fatalities versus total cases. And again, the number seems screwy. So you see tons of fatalities in Wuhan and then other cities in China, no fatalities. You don't know why. And you see countries that are claiming no fatalities. And all of a sudden South Korea goes bonkers and there's tons of fatalities in South Korea. And that is not a banana Republic. Right. And so so it's, it's complicated, but what you don't do, in my opinion, what you do not do is look at the fatality 
to total case ratio. I think that's a flawed way to look at it because the total cases could be growing so quickly right. that they're racing on ahead of the fatalities. And so you could have, of the existing total cases, half of those people could die. Exactly. What and you, What you want to pay attention to are the fatality to, to recovery ratios. And this is where it gets very hazy. It's very difficult to get good numbers on that because because the recoveries. I don't think they were they monitor recoveries as much as they monitor the deaths. And so I've seen numbers that um, go very high. I've seen numbers. There, there's this one website that I have booted up, but it takes a while to fish through. But it's a pretty good website that plots the recovery versus the the fatality and it looks to me like it's heading for some asymptotic approach to high high to middle single digit fatality now i don't know where the numbers come from a lot of them are very dependent upon china so i i think if you ignore china and you just pay attention to the cruise ship you pay attention to uh korea Iran apparently is getting thwacked, not big numbers, but the, the, the percentage of people who are getting it and dying according to Iran's numbers is very high, something like 40 percent. But it could be they're just not detecting it. Could be that. Right. And to go back to your point about to go back to your point about new infections racing ahead of fatalities, it's also, you know, the number of new infections is predicated and dependent on the rate at which we can test people. So if we're not prepared right. to be tested, you know, it only exists within the confines of our capabilities to test people. So there could be way more people that have it that we don't know about. Yeah, and and if if you're worried about, so let's say the the, the authorities can see the 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 world supply of test kits. So undoubtedly they've been making phone calls by the by the bazillions, <laughs> and they might be calling all the you know. Let's say, for example, you need uh, th there's going to be a spike in demand for just the thermometers that swipe across people's forehead. So up until December, there was a standard world demand, and there was probably some factory in China that cranked out some number per month, and that was the steady state supply for what the world demanded. And if if the world needed more, then they would increase the capacity. But it, it was it was a gradual change. If all of a sudden the world demand for thermometers goes up twenty fold, they can't make them, and so so you will hit a limit where where you don't even have thermometers to measure people's temperatures potentially. And certainly the test kits seem to be uh, showing a lot of false results. Right. So it may be that the that the diagnosis is either very wrong, is very wrong on the upside or the downside. I, I don't know which, I don't know which side it's airing on, but I've heard rumors of very large errors in the, the test kits. And in yeah, some places where I think people testing, people testing negative and then going out and fucking off for two weeks and doing their normal routine. And then two weeks later, testing positive. Yeah. So Bianco put together some numbers. And again, whenever I quote a number, please recognize that these, I don't know where they're coming from. I don't know if Jim knows where they're coming from, but he, he said that there was a 3.4% fatality to total case ratio. Right. That's the monster. That's a monster. Because the total case ratio potentially is, is got fatalities embedded in it. And so that means 3.4 is the lower limit. Right. And, and, and how, how high could it go? I don't know. So, so this, and this could be a dud. This could turn out to be, you know, less deaths than a normal flu season. That would be wonderful. But, but, yeah. But there was a graphic posted where they showed, uh, they showed the cases of MERS, SARS, coronavirus, one other, and they show it from the day of detection, right? Patient one, day one. And and then the thing morphs. It's one of these things where it goes day one, day two, day three, and they show the plots. That's a very clever graphic. And you can't even see coronavirus. You can't see you can't see it. And then around twenty days in, it just takes off and it just shoots the moon above these others. So it seems to be much more infectious, I think. Now the most disturbing thing of all, here's the big one, here's the monster. Um there's rumors that what what I first saw was they were treating people with antivirals 
and they were getting much better fast. Right. Everyone was rejoicing. But this gets back to the pharmaceutical industry. So you have some antiviral. I can't even pronounce the name. I think it was um, uh, rem. Uh, yeah, something. Yeah, rem it with an R. Rem, remdesivir. Rem, or something. Remdesivir. Or yeah, something Gilead's like drug, right? Right, and and they were saying it was working really well. Well, Gilead can't all of a sudden make eight billion doses. Right. <laughs> right. So the, the, you find out. So 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 when when a drug company prepares to do a campaign. Now, some places, so something like Lipitor, Pfizer's Lipitor must have a factory that's pumping Lipitor as fast as it can. I was consulted specifically for Lipitor because the world's demand was so high. They're trying to figure out how to make it more efficiently. I, I, I mean, I can sell for them on it already, but, but they, had a, they called in people from all over the world from their plants to, to discuss their Lipitor production. Um, if all of a sudden they need something, it takes months to put together a campaign for right. something. You you have to, you've got thousands of gallons of solvents. You've got you've got you got hundreds of kilos of various compounds that are part of the drug synthesis. You don't just you don't just flip one of those out say, Okay, next week we're gonna make resmas whatever. Right. <laughs> Res the deer. Um and and so so it, it could work beautifully. So what? But what what was scary is they they treated some people with some of the AIDS drugs. I think. Right. That's that. That's and, the other thing. And people seem to get better very quickly. And then all of a sudden they, we start hearing reports again. Who knows if it's true that these people were getting it again and dying. Right. Yep. And it was an acute death. It was it was not getting it again and feeling shitty. It was getting it again and then going into cardiac arrest. Right, and so then the question is, did they get it again? I not, I don't believe it actually. The question is, well, did, can does this thing not go away? And a lot of people are having trouble with that. Well, what I can tell you is, there are plenty of viral infections that never go away, like right. a warts or viruses, canker sores or viruses, shingles or viruses. They're all viruses that lurked in your system and hung out and decided to come out and, and haunt you. And uh, and so so th this thing could be one of these camp out in your nervous system viruses and AIDS, right? You you, you can keep AIDS to an undetectable level, but if if the patient goes off the AIDS meds, boom! I think I think when an AIDS patient goes off the AIDS drugs, they not only get the AIDS, but I think it comes roaring back. Yeah, interesting. Really? So, so then the question is: Is it possible that by suppressing it, you, 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 uh, you made you made it come back even stronger in an anti-fragile sort of way? And what that may mean that that it could be like shingles, like super shingles on steroids, where you you get better and then you get worse again. I think uh, you know one of the problems is I I wrote an article on February second that you know, urged people to pay very close attention to the numbers outside of China due to the opacity with China and uh, recently wrote an article like two or three days ago urging the United States to, you know, it's time. It's time to really, yeah, I read that. you know, I read that one. try to get as far in front of this as possible, even though we can't, even though it's, you know, first of all, we got to get over the hurdle that, that the Fed and the government think that there are, you know, no problems that they can't print money at that they're not going to fix because that's not true. Yeah, they should print a vaccine. <laughs> exactly. But that's the first problem. But, um, you know, if there's one kind of not silver lining, but it's that, you know, this did happen. It started halfway across the world. So uh, in the United States, we have an opportunity to really try as hard as we can to get out in front of it as much as humanly possible. And, Hopefully, you know, I've seen now several headlines of several companies sending vaccines to uh, start clinical trials. Uh, hopefully we can we can get in front of it and, and it doesn't doesn't wind up getting too late. But it's got that feeling to it, Dave, you know, given well, all you these. Know, it takes a long time to develop vaccines and things like that. But you don't just whip these things out in a month. Right. So, you know, there, when I said I, you, we might have masks in our basement, in our stock room, I haven't bothered to check. It's for several reasons. One is, first of all, the masks are said to be of no value. The only thing the masks do 
is they get you to not touch your face. Right. Supposedly transmission from your fingers to your mouth and eyes and stuff. But, uh, you know, that, that's a pretty modest gain. And the, the second thing is that, that I really do think of. My personal bias is that if I need a mask, it's, it's going to work through the population anyways. The trick is, is to try to keep it moving slowly enough that the medical system doesn't get overwhelmed. Right. I, I, I don't know what's going to happen. Some guy went to the ER and he wanted a flu shot. He, he wanted to be checked for flu and he didn't have very good insurance, he said. And next thing you know, he's got a bunch of people in moon suits spraying disinfectant under the door and then coming in and they want to do a corona test. And he said, I just, I just need a flu test. And, and so society doesn't know how to handle this. They, that's, that's the thing that's really interesting is that, that like the cruise ship, they didn't know what to do with the cruise ship. It became this ethical dilemma. My, my wife sort of faced something like this. She one time had an injection in her spine, a, a she had a, a myelogram, something. I'm trying to remember what it was, but it was a needle in the spine, and and it started leaking, and it causes spinal headaches. They're called, and she was she was suffering. She was in a hospital. She's in the hospital for 16 days, and finally the doctor says, "Look, I can't check her out, but you can check her out if you want." And that was the message: don't don't keep her here. This is making no sense. But but the 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 system doesn't have great great idea so i've seen huge criticism of how they handled the cruise ship in japan i don't know what they were supposed to do i have no idea what they were supposed to do well i think again just to go back on what i said a couple moments ago i think part of the problem here is that the whole world has been conditioned to think that bad things just can't happen and you know i it's it's just fascinating. You know, I spent a lot of time thinking about it. And as somebody that's paranoid and somebody that is a skeptic and somebody that, you know, just doesn't buy what I'm told. I mean, I think about it probably to a fault, probably way more than any normal person should. Um, and, you know, there were years ago where I had to get my head straightened out because I was going too far in the other direction. But... I also believe that the vast majority of people out there, they don't consider it at all. And I think there's blame to go around for that. Um, you know, I, it's an interesting question. I, I'm unaware because anyone with an earshot of me is aware. Right. <laughs> so it, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tainted experiment, but I don't know what people know. So your experiences, they don't know, they're not paying attention? Well, I just think in general, I think that there's, I think people have just been conditioned to believe that everything is going to be comfortable at all times. And especially right. here, you know, in problems. the first world. Right, exactly. And that buck kind of has always stopped at the very, you know, when was the last time we had a huge kind of existential problem? What well, was the financial crisis? And the Fed bailed bailed us out and you know ben bernanke saved the world according to him in his book right so far right so far. and so there's always been there's always been a safety net there of sorts that people think kind of is always there and and this is such a unique and unexpected problem at an unexpected time that it's catching everybody flat-footed and that is why i think it is a real risk and that's why i think that there's the real chance of something going, uh, getting much worse before it gets better. Well, I, I happened to reach out to our provost this morning and I said, look, if you need a, need any volunteers to serve on some brainstorming committee to figure out what to do, uh, I said, what I do know is, is that, that you could end up having to make decisions that you don't want to make hastily. Right. And this is not like a snow day where you say, oh, shit, we got, you know, 30 inches coming. Let's call a snow day. Uh, and, and you want to have thought about what will you do in the event? I mean, what do you do if, you know, if 10 percent, 10 students at Cornell have this thing and you got lecture halls filled with 350 kids? What do you do? I don't have an answer to that question. And when you're lecturing in front of 350 kids, by the middle of the semester, you can hear them hacking and coughing and sniffling right. because they're all sick. They're all they're all 
stretching themselves to the limit, either staying up late doing their work or getting shit faced or whatever they're <laughs> doing. And so they're 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 you know I've had many many occasions where I've said to the class, just looking at them or hearing them saying, you know, you gotta get some sleep, guys. Like you're so, you're you're sounding sick. This lecture room is filled with sick people. You gotta get some sleep. I, I don't care how much work you gotta do. It's not gonna do any good if you're sick. And, uh, and so what do you do when you got a lecture hall filled with that as your baseline? And you have no idea if these people hacking and coughing or, or you know, typhoid Marys. Yeah, it's, uh, and you just think about that. One of the things that concerns me was the paper. So we'll talk about this kind of in two different sections. The first is China changing the narrative on things which if you follow the Global Times, uh, which is this, you know, the state media, and you follow what their editor-in-chief has been posting on Twitter, they went from everything's fine, you know, no problem, to wow, hey, the world really fucked up and, and misinterpreted how bad this was going to be, you know, of recent, which I thought was worrisome. They also posted something a couple of days ago. The Global Times posted research from a Chinese researcher who drew the conclusion that this thing may have started in November. And if well, that, that's what I've been hearing rumors of. Yeah, and if, you, and if that's true, and I, again, there's no, I don't know if it's true or if it's not true, but if that's true, then you got to think about people traveling to, and I mean, you're talking about hundreds of flights leaving and coming into China on a daily basis and people going all over the world. I mean, there's just... It's so if we had a month and, and Dave, we didn't even cancel travel in the United States to and from China until like the third week in January. And the director right. of the World Health Organization's given a press conference fucking commending China on what a great job they did and how everything's fine. I remember the market rallied like 400 points that day. And it, the truth may be that you had 10 weeks prior to that where people were just coming and going as they please. And, you know, we don't really know. Well, I think the Chinese state the statements coming out of China, of course, are filled with malarkey, uh, but no much, no more malarkey than statements coming out of presidential candidates and current presidents, right? Guys like that, right? So, the, if their lips are moving, they're lying. Uh, but, but, I think the narrative does keep changing. I think it started out as a cover up, and then it became we're all over it. We're being very aggressive, and now it appears to me as though the numbers coming out of China are simply not changing at all, and that's in, that that strikes me as impossible. It seems it just it it's just like it's just all fixed, and meanwhile the rest of the world is is starting to really rip now, and and so I think the Chinese decided that now their problem was is to not let their economy collapse. Right. And so I think what they're, and I think the problem they're having is they're saying go back to work. Yeah, they're and, restarting flights and, too, and domestic the, flights. Yeah, but the people aren't buying it. That's what my understanding is. The people aren't buying it, so they're having trouble getting them to go to work. And if people don't go to work, now if it's a serious problem, then there are people to go to work. And if it's a real serious problem, there are going to be people who, you know, there's a picture, there was a photograph and uh, yeah. the difference in being aware and unaware of, of the theories is, is really a difference in being on or off off or on social media so if you're on Twitter you're you're getting such a different feed than if you're watching the evening news 100% yep I, the evening news and, is weeks behind where Twitter is oh uh, weeks behind it and so so Twitter's filled with people who are who are dropping you know emails from suppliers I, I've reached out to a number I put out a tweet and said can anyone give me first-hand information about restricted supplies of goods and services from China and, and it filled up people said yeah we use such and such a chip for this and we haven't even gotten an answer out of anyone since January and stuff like that. So there's a lot of people complaining about supply constraints already. So, and you know, there's macro economists from the big sh bucket shops, you know, JP Morgan, places like that, um, that are that are saying this is going to clip one percent off Chinese China's GDP. And I'm going try 25. Right. I, I don't I don't understand how this is remotely possible that you can quarantine the entire country 
and cut 1% off your GDP. There's, there aren't even cars on the road half the time. And, and you know, one guy, there was, but, but you also don't know that like there's this Chinese woman who keeps posting from China, but you don't know if she's full of crap, but she's, she's being followed carefully. She's getting retweeted and she's getting monitored. And so you, you, there, there's, there's so much information. There's so much, so many claims and so little truly, truly dependable information. So I, one of the things I said to Kyle, I said, this may seem naive to you, but I'm just stunned at how much China's been able to shut down the information flow. Right. But I think it's also true elsewhere. I, I think it's true in every country. So when you, when you spoke to your friend, the virologist or the uh, biologist, I can't remember what we were talking about earlier. Did they, did they conclude that it was uh, likely man-made or likely natural? So, so this friend of mine, um, sort of dug into the papers and dug into the claims. So there's claims that there's something like six codons, which each has three base pairs, uh, that are tied to the AIDS virus, for example. And there's, there's other kind of claims about this, some region that makes it really infectious, some binding site, which is beyond me at this point. But I, I, I try to listen. What I listen for is, does it sound sciencey enough to be believable? <laughs> or is it, well, it could be just some blogger. So I, right. I actually don't care about the conclusions if I can understand the whole story because they don't know what they're talking about. I want, I want to get the guys who tell me the conclusions where, where they, they, they were too deep for me to grasp. Right. And, uh, and, and he dug into that stuff and he's qualified to at least get it at a pretty good level. This guy's been doing this stuff for a long time. And, and he, he said that he didn't think the case was very strong for a, a man. Uh, leakage from a lab, sure, man-made, engineered. He said he didn't think it was that strong. Now, I've it. seen debunkings of it that I found. It's one of those things where when you debunk the debunking, you go, okay, there's a problem now then. Right. Who, why are they debunking it so poorly? And, you know, they went and found some some codon sequence, and they said, look, this can be found in, in uh, this many other viruses. And then you – but it reminds me of when uh, – of when you know Nicole Simpson at the crime scene, they found blood, and OJ's blood type wasn't that normal. And they said that you know this is OJ's blood type, and and the defense team said, yeah, there's forty thousand people in in Los Angeles who have that blood type, and the prosecution said, yeah, they're not married to Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 it reminds me of that where you say, okay, maybe this this sequence is elsewhere, but it. It, it seems a little fishy, and there are supposedly sequences in there that that are not found in normal bat viruses. But I don't know. I don't know who's lying. This is the frustrating thing. Uh, is is uh, and and then you know there's uh, God the shit some of those guys eat. You know the oh well it's in insane. The, well, in the rural countryside especially, I you know not to blame them because. If you're living out in the boonies of China, I, I think you've learned not to starve to death. I think that's 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 a skill that that is culturally endemic. And so, if you're out in the boonies in China, uh, you 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 learn to eat anything that moves. And, and some guy made a half-hour video in which he 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 moto, mopeded his way around the boonies of China, just videotaping stuff, and and you see some pretty weird stuff. And, and so, uh, so it wouldn't, sh you know, that's not a, it's not a surprise that from this emerges the occasional, you know, don't forget that a swine flu that killed a quarter of their pigs and heaven only knows maybe it, maybe those two are tied, right? <laughs> it's really, it's, it's, it's really hard to know. And what's frustrating is at the onset, out of the gate, when basically you're just looking for as much possible information on this as possible and then to kind of whittle your way away at what the facts are which is the same thing that the world health organization does it's the same thing that the cdc does it's the same thing that the government does right when something like this happens there's an instant shock and then there's a bunch of information and then all of these government organizations do the same thing that people like you do like people like me do which is and other news organizations do, which is they try to just whittle away at what the you know what the truth is. Yeah, but the they can't do it in public. So you and I can do this. We can speculate on all sorts of stuff, and only the most severe nitwits listening will actually think we have some authoritative view of the world. Which we don't. 
when the when the World Health Organization, the former head of the CDC or former head of you know the FDA or whatever comes out and utters something, it's like when the Fed utters something. Right. <laughs> right. And so the whole the whole world has some paroxysm to use a phrase that David Stockman likes to use a lot. Uh, they can't go uttering stuff like this. So you're not going to get a straight answer out of them until they absolutely intentionally wish to give that straight answer. Right. So when they say this is getting to the U.S., I think they're saying this is getting to the U.S. I don't think they would say it's getting to the U.S. if they thought it was a chance. I think they'd be holding back until they go, okay, we better let people know it could right. be coming because it is coming. So my, my, the reason I don't get the math, I think it's coming. I think we're going to have to live through it. Yeah, I mean, I think so too. I think it's an inevitability at this point. And, uh, you know, it's just a question of what, what we can do. The point I was going to make there uh, with what I was saying before, though, is it's why it was so discouraging to see Twitter ban Zero Hedge. Uh, after they published that article, you know, asking questions about whether or not the, the virus was man-made or not. And regardless of whether or not it is or it isn't, they were asking the question of whether or not it was. And many other news organizations also publicly asked that question, but, you know, two and a half weeks after they did. And it's very discouraging to see things like that because, you know, it's okay to stick to the facts and stick to the science and dispel what clearly isn't truth and I think it's so important in a situation like this but to uh, to try to just shut somebody down for asking those questions well, so, and- so zero head zero hedge banning is a complicated story I, I don't like a lifetime ban of anybody yeah that's I think timeouts right? if you, if you want to have a 24 hour timeout followed by a week timeout followed by a calendar year timeout but a lifetime ban to me is 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 unacceptable for anybody they if, if they if after a year they come back and they can't behave themselves then maybe but I, i'm just not a big fan of that uh and and so i think that's i think at some point the supreme court's got to get into that and say no you're a platform you you can't do that but <clears throat> so what god zero hedge booted and, and i certainly tweeted my ass off about it but what got him booted was when they doxed that Chinese scientist. Yeah, but they didn't, so they didn't they, dox him, though. Well, they did, though. So what happened was his all the information they gave was public. But in but in their write-up, they said, you know, it wouldn't hurt to reach out to this guy and ask him some questions. And, you know, they, they were, they were kind of sending the, sending the mob at him. In my, when I read it, the first time I read it, it, it I thought it was kind of cringeworthy. And as I read it, I'm thinking, this guy better be guilty of something because they just released the hounds. And so now, with that said, I, I think instead of saying, you know, pull it, maybe they were told pull it and they said, screw you. And then, then at some point, you know, I, I, I think – I think I think it's okay to say, look, that thing is inflammatory. Get it out of there. And if you're not willing to pull it on some principle, you, right. you might be you might be fertilizing the the tree of liberty, right? And so, so well, I and think then and then for BuzzFeed to come out and say, oh, a pro-Trump blog docs the scientist and play, you know, BuzzFeed. Well, so, is- yeah, you know, I'd pull the thing and then I'd write an article about how I had to pull a tweet. I think this is wrong. That's how you do it, right? And, and instead, if they did that, they stood on principles and they got booted. And I, I don't think it was correct. I don't think a single infraction was correct. So one could argue that Zero Hedge had a bullseye on its ass and they were waiting for Zero Hedge to make a mistake. Right. I think that, that might have been the case. I think that's the most logical model. I think that's the most, so I think Zero Hedge did bone it. And I think that, that they did pull – it's sort of like Roger Stone's arrest, right? They sent in a, a SWAT team at 4 in the morning to arrest Roger Stone. Any a, a more rational way would be to say, hey, uh, Roger, <laughs> show up at, show up come at the DA's the office at 9 a.m. with right. your lawyer, right? That's how, <laughs> that's how it's normally done for these white-collar guys. <laughs> like Roger's, like Roger that, Stone sitting in his house uh, you know, with uh, armed guards and – you know, a uh, yeah, it's just and also CNN happened to be there too. I don't know if you noticed. Yeah, just by chance. Just At by chance. Four o'clock in the morning when they raided Roger Stone's house, CNN yeah. was there. Yeah, that was a that was the, a show raid right with there with the cameras set up 
with everything set up, ready to roll, you know, like the, the network that's never live at 4 a.m. was just happened to be live that day also, too. Hey, I'm just hanging out here. I just got a hunch, you know. <laughs> so so to, to, to get us back on target, so one of the questions that comes up, what what does Japan do with the Olympics this summer, potentially? Yeah, this Tokyo, huge right? Question. Yeah, it's a huge, 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 huge question. And and because you bring people from all over the world, and by then it might already be resolved, as in like, don't do it, or yeah. it might be ambiguous. Uh, their worst nightmare is for it to be ambiguous. I, well, right. the worst nightmare is for everyone to be dead. But uh, so I don't know what they do. I, you know, how many coronavirus cases do you have in an organization before you s- stop making people come to work? Right. And, and the again, we're we're back to an unprecedented situation unless it gets to the West and no one's dying. You think that's and, a possibility? And right now, there have not been a lot of deaths in the West. There, there are pockets. For example, I would call Korea the West. <laughs> Korea is a totally industrialized state. And, and why it's blowing up in South Korea right now, supposedly there's some religious organization that got a lot of it, something like that. But... Um, but if 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 industrialized societies with with you know adequate healthcare systems can can deal with it, then a lot of these ethical questions go away to a reasonable extent. Right. If the death toll gets up to you know one five uh, percent though, and if that if that's a reasonable estimate, you know. One in twenty people. You know, I've got thirty colleagues, so statistically, at least one of them's going to die, and that, that seems like a big number to me. <laughs> it's wild, <laughs> right? And 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 you know, uh, if ten percent die, then you're going to lose eight hundred million globally. Right. Yeah, it's wild. And that's a lot of people. So and it still hasn't gotten into the guts of these. Big, huge, you know, uh, marginally functional cities of the world. Right, the, you know, right. The Africa's, the, the Indias. That's yeah. it's going to be and a fucking know, problem. These claims that the that it doesn't do well in warm weather. Well, no one knows. Right. These right. claims are completely, completely wishful. There are viruses supposedly that don't do well in warm weather. It's also possible something like the flu isn't it? Isn't that it does well poorly in warm weather? But people's own immune systems get better and more resistant. And so maybe you get the flu in the winter, not because the, the, the flu virus is a problem only in the winter, but because your body's a problem only in the winter. So I, it, it's very hard to know what's going to happen. Right. And, and you know, I, I, I'm not in some panic mode here. This is not me. Uh, this, is not, this is not me, you know, getting all wound up. By the way, someone said, you know, I was asking about these supply chain problems and one of my tweeters who's, who's a rough edged guy but I respect his wisdom but he's very rough and he says you're, you're, you're digitally stamp collecting and I thought about that so that's an interesting way of thinking about it so we're, we're collecting information where, where, where at the end we're going to get the answer key right and so why not just wait yeah but but by that model also well then don't watch the Super Bowl either and just look at the score at the end. So in some right. sense this is this, there's a sporting event analogy here, not to not to trivialize it, but they're they're watching it play out, and trying to understand it, and understanding the dynamics is a is an intellectually uh, satisfying thing to try to do, even if it's a uh, even if if it's you know gallows level science. Well, it's new and it's unprecedented. Uh, I mean, pandemics aren't unprecedented, but it's it's just it's going to be an interesting experiment, and it already is in human psychology. And it's uh, like you said, yeah. I was speaking to my mother today and talking about preparations, and uh, I called her several weeks ago and urged my family to prepare, as I've been kind of putting on Twitter uh, as well. And you know, I sound less like a psycho uh, to them today than I did three weeks ago with the news the way that it's been unfolding Um, which is unfortunate because I'd much rather this whole thing just be over with and not be right about it you know people say oh you know stop enjoying whatever you know you're short the market and it's like I'm not like I'd rather fucking be short the market and get and get smacked 
and have this thing be over and done with than be in the situation we're in now. So like going well, back I'm to your going back to your of Kyle people who think that way. I'm I'm critical of the Pollyannas they were called. And that is everyone you know you face risk fairly regularly. Right. And and part of evolution says you got to mitigate that risk. Exactly. And so when you when you attempt to mitigate risk and it turns out the risk was only, was 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 not that something bad happened but something that could have happened then then if by virtue of fact nothing bad happened means you're an idiot then that, that, that's just stupid and so when people say ah oh, you know i'll just come to your house i go well i'm not sharing it with you you douchebag right exactly uh, and, and, and the one i said one time in class so so y2k was a risk and and people get laughed at well the fed put 40 million into their y2k brainstem try to track it and I, I knew guys in IT who were saying I don't know what's going to happen so it was risk and the probability may have been low but it was a real fat tail risk and so uh, and, and at some point someone said well I'm going to come to your house I said bring your daughter <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I don't want to hear that and here's the problem if let's say you're a cop or you're a fireman or you're a doctor or something and you haven't mitigated risk. So you're going to be in this situation where we need you to go to work and you're trying to figure out whether you should stay home and take care of problems that are, that are there because you didn't mitigate risk. Right. And you know, I'm not needed. If Cornell wants to not teach a graduate course in organic chemistry, we'll be okay. But but there are people who are essential and they right. ought to be prepared at home. And the more people who are prepared, the less people who are wards of the state. Very simple and makes a lot more sense now to people probably than it did several weeks ago. And I think in coming days it's gonna make even more sense to well, people. I but also, I think you're hundred you know, percent right. But two years ago, I wrote a, I wrote uh, in my annual review. I wrote uh, a, a chapter on the merits of price gouging, and I've had people get so livid at the idea of price gouging. I said, "Look, it's not Walmart that's price gouging; it's some guy who drives a truckload of generators down to Florida after a hurricane and charges right. you twice what a generator should cost. You can tell him he can't charge twice. He took risk. He he loaded up his truck. It might have been a dud. He could be stuck with a bunch of generators. Doesn't know what to do with it. Meanwhile, if you say you can't charge more, he ain't coming. Right. Exactly. And so that's just stupid. And, and you're and if seeing you look this. At, you're seeing this now. There's floods up in the North Country. Right? Well, there are floods up in the North Country with Hurricane Irene. And I went up there about three weeks later. My well, my wife ran a recovery center up there. FEMA was nowhere in sight. And and what was really noticeable at the North Country, I get up there about three weeks later, and they're already recovering. And the reason is because, is goddamn, every third person has a backhoe. Everybody has chainsaws. Everyone right. knows how to swing a hammer because this is the Adirondacks. These guys aren't a bunch of wusses. They know how to fix crap, and they know that Mother Nature tries to turn everything they own to dirt. And so they were ready. And they, I got up there, and they had replaced hundreds of miles of road. They had replaced bridges with temp bridges. They knew what to do because they just rolled up their sleeves and said, okay, let's do it. Most places can't do that. And so I, I think you do mitigate risk, and I think you're going to be wrong 95% of the time. But when you're right... That's that's the Darwinian moment, right? Well, exactly, and and like I always say when I'm talking about macroeconomics, I mean you only got to be right once, you know. It's uh, it's it's wild. I think a good example is several weeks ago I first posted on Twitter. I said I'm going to go get some ammunition and some whiskey. Those were the first things I bought before I, before I <laughs> before I bought food, before I bought. Lysol and you know Tyvek suits and masks and all the other shit that I have but like I went and I bought ammunition and I bought whiskey and I said well, what good is uh, any of this other shit if I can't protect my home right and uh, three yeah. three weeks ago you know I just got a got a whole load of shit for it on Twitter and then I went back to get some more ammunition a couple of days ago and had a very matter of fact conversation with the guy at the gun counter who you know, we were talking about the situation who understood exactly what I was doing and exactly why I was doing it. And I just think to myself, well, here's the guy that comes off like the total, you know, 
NRA gun-toting right-wing psychopath all all the rest of the time but when the script flips and you know we're at the inverse of normal this is really the only guy that's got his fucking head screwed on straight you know so so it just plays to exactly what you're saying right like when you're trying to mitigate risk when it's not there people give you shit and they tell you you look like an idiot and the worst part is sometimes you start to doubt yourself but well and and so uh and so my level of prepping is not at the level that my level of prepping was for Y2K. Right. Y2K, by the way, changed the way I live my life. And it was a positive. So when I go to the store to buy sugar, I'll buy those little yellow, you know, those yellow canisters of sugar from, from uh, uh, whatever. And uh, I'll buy a dozen of them and put them in my basement. So instead of going to the store when I'm out of sugar, I go to the basement. Right. And I, I, that's how I live now. And I keep... You know, I've got a big storage thing in my garage, and I keep a, a number of number of packages of toilet paper, a number of packages of paper towels. I keep a number of jugs of uh, of laundry detergent. I I I and and it's just when I buy one, I say, look, I'm out. I'll then go if if I'm out of Splenda, I'll go buy myself five thousand packets of Splenda. And it doesn't expire. It, it doesn't right. expire, and it doesn't fucking. You know, there's no. It saves you a trip to the market the next time you want to go. Like my, I had an ex girlfriend who used to joke with me all the time because I had I was living in an apartment and I had one room in the because I'm just by myself. I had one room that was supposed to be a closet where I basically just had you know 50 of everything. And if I go and something was on sale, I'll just I'll buy the fucking lot. You know, like no problem. And she used to call it the reserve. She used to say, I you know you. You had a detergent. You got to go. You got to go down into the reserve and get it. You know, and that was yeah. The- and 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 the the thing is, um, I decided I would not go that deep again. But at the same time, I I didn't swear off preparing. I just I, I was attempting to prepare against all eventualities, and I didn't squander serious money. I donated a lot of stuff to soup kitchens and stuff like that, so it was not a big deal. But uh, I spent a lot of money by some people's standards, but not not by mine. And uh, but but here's what I tell I'm telling colleagues, and I have not posted this on Twitter. I've got too many followers to post this on Twitter. I'm about to say it, so I'm just breaking the fucking rule. Yeah, geez, you're only going to get like a hundred thousand listens on this podcast. Yeah, right. But uh, you know, a, a, a hundred pounds of rice costs fifty bucks. Yep. A hundred pounds of rice. It, it might not be nutritious, but you won't be sitting around suffering. Yeah, you'll, you'll be you'll be malnourished. But a hundred pounds of rice can feed you for a long time. You could just soak it in goddamn water. I live in a lake, so water's not an issue. I can go get water if I have to. And uh, and and then you say, well, it really sucks, you know. So so it turns out you can you can take the rice, you can sprinkle some goddamn Splenda on it, make it taste a lot better. Yeah, or like anything, so, you know. Yeah, you can buy yourself, you know, ten bucks worth of bullion cubes. And, and so there's all sorts of things you can do. And if you if you realize that if you do a thoughtful analysis, and you 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 set yourself up so that you know the real shame would be if there was some ice storm or some EMP or or something that just just prevented you from having access to the store right to starve after a month right what yep. an idiot right what a stupid person you were unless you <laughs> happen to not be able to do this there are people who can I, I sympathize with them they don't have the space or or they right. don't have the money and I'm not calling them stupid idiots but there are plenty of people who could do this you can and buy you, can, you know, in New Zealand, I hear there might be some Zealanders out there. I don't know. There's a nickname for them, no doubt. But um, I heard in New Zealand, you're supposed to have four months worth of food in your house at all times by law. Wow. Now, I don't know if that's true or urban legend, but but it's an island. And they're saying, look, you don't know. And so that's kind of how I live. And I'm, I'm restocking a little. It had gotten low because I have a at least one adult child who somehow my stash always seems to go down when he visits. Uh, and, um, you know, I just bought a whole bunch of cases of dog food cause they'll eat it. I got three goddamn Labradors, right? There's no doubt they'll eat it. And, and I, I'd hate to, you know, look up and say, Holy cow, we don't have any dog food for these guys. That would be pretty stupid. Uh, they'll definitely it? eat it. Dogs are machines for turning uh, food into right. shit. So, so I've probably got, let me do this <laughs> quick math. I, right now I probably have uh, uh, two months worth of dog food. 
And, you know, if it lasts more than two months, we got a problem. I admit that. But it'd be stupid to not have been ready for two months. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You can go buy, you can buy a fucking pallet of top ramen, okay? Which right. doesn't expire and would last through a nuclear holocaust. Go buy yourself a case of raspberry jello. You, can, you can buy a pallet, Dave. I, I was at Aldi today. The top ramen comes in those little uh, packages, not the cup of noodles, but the ones that come in the little plastic packages. There's like there's like ten or fifteen of them to a box, and a box at Aldi was like a dollar sixty nine, and like the pallet had like, you know. I don't know, 50 boxes on already. You could buy a pallet of Top Ramen for like $60. But you could also buy rice at 50 cents a dry weight pound. Right. And, and can Campbell's chicken noodle soup or something. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so there, there's things you can do for almost nothing, and it's just inexcusable to not. Because the, here's the problem. You know, when there's a hurricane, and I wrote about in this whole price gouging section that I wrote, I wrote about the hurricanes. I wrote about people not being ready. And, you know, if the price of plywood went up when a hurricane was coming, maybe people wouldn't be so fucking stupid right. to not get ready in advance and therefore not be part of the problem. And so let the price of plywood soar. Let the people say, you know, next time I'm going to do it when it's cheap. Right. And then there won't be a run on plywood because we'll all be ready like in the Adirondacks. Right. So the and whole, the price won't go up as much. Price, I don't even – I'll tell you, there are some situations where you go, that's kind of tasteless. That's kind of tasteless. So if someone has like, but 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 if if you're a local pharmacy or something, you jack up the price of drugs. Guess what? You're gonna get lynched. So so you, there's the the p most of the potential source of price gouging, they're not gonna do it because they they have customers. Walmart would get slaughtered if they raised the price of something in the in the in the you know as a hurricane came. They'd get killed. In fact, one of one time they got it this bad rep and they apologized like hell and I looked at the picture and I realized it had been photoshopped but but Walmart still apologized. Yeah. And so so that was in there. And so that, you know, price gouging, what a stupid concept. Let the market determine the price. And so when a hurricane's coming, plywood's worth more money. And, pe- and, and you know, and, that's- and, and you know, and, and if you if you need ice, some guys got arrested for selling ice expensively. Well, if you've got insulin and you got to ice it, and some other guy's got beer and he wants to ice it. What do you? How do you determine how to allocate that ice? Well, right. the guy who has the insulin will pay up, and that's how you keep the guy from the beer saying, you know, I don't think I need this beer that badly. I'll drink it warm. And that's how you do it. That's how it works. And, and next time, more people. If you, if someone can make a ton with ice more people bring ice down there. And I remember the Florida governor before one of the hurricanes that year that I wrote about, she said, yeah, if you come down here and you price gouge, we're going to get you. I'm going, well, I guess no one's going to bring truckloads down there, are they? Right. And it's also like, worry about the fucking hurricane. You know, like there was just a, there was a uh, headline that hit the wire earlier today. Northern Italy is investigating, you know, price hikes on, masks it's like investigate the fucking virus you know right, like, <laughs> right. and by the way they, you know if, if i were being autocratic i'd shut down the sale of masks and say put them away and keep them for the doctors right that 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 would be the the that would be the non-free market move i'd make is i'd say all them but here's the problem china's keeping all their masks Right. They make the mass and some of the oh, you know possession is nine tenths the law in that case it's ten tenths of the law they don't have to sell us masks. Right. And they're and they've got a billion people who are trying to wear masks, so they're not going to ship them. And and so so the, I tried to tell my doctor who's doing the surgery next week. I said, "You know, you guys ought to put some masks in place. I think they're going to go." And he looked at me like I was looned. Yeah, like I, I know really it's crazy. It's crazy. And and so uh so so again, the real risk here is that this virus has a double hit, and you get knocked out by the second punch. That's 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 the that's the one we don't know about yet. And then there, I started to tell you there's a picture of a of an apartment complex that a person posted. Again, these could be total fabrications, but it was an apartment complex. It was night. It was 30 stories, and there were seven rooms that were lit. And they said on a normal night these rooms are all lit. Why aren't they lit? And part of it could be the people left. That's one of the thoughts. One of the thoughts is they're all sick. 
They're just laying in their beds, just trying to figure out how to function. Right. They're dead. There's corpses in those beds. Who knows? But the fact of the matter is that's a complete and utter shutdown of that apartment building. And maybe they don't want to turn their lights on because they don't want the authorities to know who's in there. Because if you come out and say, hey, I've got the virus, I, I don't know, but the rumors are you get hauled away and you get put in one of those nouveau hospitals that really looks like a gulag. Yeah, all I can think about was I was watching National Geographic has a show called Doomsday Preppers, and I had been watching that like some months back with a friend who said to me, these people have mental illnesses. These people are insane. You know, there were guys preparing for everything. I'm just, I was thinking just a couple of days ago about that, watching that and what that person said to me. I'm just like, these people are fucking chilling right now. That's what's happening. You know what I mean? Like this, the guy that is head of his household that they were interviewing, saying, I'm just desperately, desperately trying to protect my kids and my wife. That guy right now is just calling everybody in the living room for the, for the same drill he's been putting on the last, like, you know, five years. All right, we fucking trained for this. You know, like everybody knows what what we're exactly what we're supposed to be doing. It's just, it's it's fucking, it's crazy. It's just crazy. Just to go back to your point about you know mitigating risk versus when it happens versus when it's not happening. Right, and and be, and to mitigate it and turn out not to not to have been hit doesn't mean your mitigation was wrong it gets back to i have car insurance i have life exactly insurance. All, all that money squandered by some people's definition but see those are socially correct mitigations yeah and what i said whereas, a couple of weeks ago is what is not. what's the downside dave to being prepared in this situation well, the other thing is if we all go out if a bunch of us go out and get food here's the problem though so when you have the problem with florida where a hurricane's coming and the shelves empty we watch it and they empty up some really stupid stuff. People go buy all the Pop Tarts, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> I, shoot me before I live on Pop Tarts. And uh, <clears throat> but 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 if if that happens because of Corona, it will be everywhere. So there'll be no outside supplier. Right. There will be no wave of a convoy of Walmart trucks to to restock those shelves because it's happening everywhere. And I don't know where all that crap comes from, but but if the supply chains around the world get broken, then then you know you've heard about the fifteen hundred mile salad, where they talk about if you actually track all the distances that all the veggies and stuff come, it's like fifteen hundred miles on average. Well, we're not going to have fifteen hundred mile salads if 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 supply chains break. So, have you done anything differently with your? portfolio than you normally no, would or are you just sitting back <laughs> my portfolio is set up for the, the zombie apocalypse right as is mine and and some guy gave me shit the other day where he where, where i said you know uh, I, I posted one of these sarcastic tweets where i said uh i said i'm not going to sell in fear um said quote said all the the boomers watching their 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 uh, retirement funds get cut in half. Right, right. When the, when the next bear market, whenever it should arrive, arrives. Right. So it was saying, look, whenever it comes, they're going to be scared. That's how it's going to work. And he just said, you've totally lost your grip. You've totally lost perspective. And I responded. I said, the market's more than two x overvalued. I have a grip. Right. Yeah. <laughs> One of and us so has lost our grip, and it's not me. Here's the problem, me. though. If the markets were, were at reasonable valuations, then then these kind of events, you know, uh, the, the, the markets are very robust. But when, when, you, when you've got markets, you know, as John Malden would say, you know, they're a market looking for a pin. Right. And you slip a suitcase nuke under them, then – so here's what you're going to want to watch for is at some point there could be sort of an all clear signal. The, the buzzer blows, says, aha, it's over, or it's, or it's finally dialing back. And I think the markets will rally fairly ferociously. I don't know where they're going to start from this because I don't know when that, that, that whistle is going to get blown. But let's say, let's say the Dow's drop 30%. And, and it's going to be an all clear signal. And then there's going to be a ferocious short squeeze. And, and what, what I think will happen is that uh, 
is that that will determine whether they whether whether the Bulls can muster another a leg up. Because, right. You know, in 1929, it crashed and then it rallied, and then it crashed more, and then it rallied, and 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 they just kept exhausting. The rallies just kept exhausting. They got 90 percent of it back from the original crash, and so I was like, oh yeah, we're fine now. But, it, but they didn't get it all back, and, th- and then so then they became hypersensitive, and so the seller showed up faster and more aggressively the second time, and then faster, more aggressively the third time, and that, that's how right. bear markets work. And you know that, and I know that, but there's the fact of the matter is there's there's probably seventy percent of the guys on Wall Street managing or, or trading people's money have only read about a savage bear market. They haven't right. witnessed it. They don't know what it looks like. They don't know what it feels like. Right. Yeah. They can't fathom, for example, what it's like to own pets.com and watch it go down 95% in a matter of months. Well, somebody they've never they've never experienced that. And so somebody so tweeted somebody tweeted who, yesterday, who, Dave, that this is what 2008 was like except this was every day for 6 months, you know. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And by the way, the housing market started to roll over in 2006. So this all forward looking, dumb, you know, smart market, you know, market knows all was basically took another year and a half before it finally registered that it was humped. And, and so, so the only, there was a few indicators that, that something bad was happening, but they were relatively minor, and you, you had to be reading, you had to be writing the blogs, right, like Seeking Alpha, one of those blogs and where, where, you know, the market ABX index was dropping, and that was the derivatives market, and that was a sign of stress. And well, what do we have? Well, we have repo stress. We have repo madness. We have a, there are signs of stress, but, but meanwhile, we got a road race. By the way, the, the, the Chinese analog of the NASDAQ as of two days ago was up 22% year to date. I know. And rallying. Right? You got a country that's in complete lockdown and their market goes up 22% year to date. That shows you it's like a two-year-old with ADHD swilling Red Bull from their bottle. Right. Like, there's yep. just nothing about these markets that makes sense. There's no sense of risk. Well, they're they're finally getting a memo, and whether whether this is the big one or this is, you know, and then Manukin and these guys come out and say, "Oh, we're going to save you again," but at some point they can't. At some point right. the House of Cards starts to go, and the the promise to not let the House of Cards go just. It doesn't, doesn't work. mean it shit. Never, it doesn't mean it shit. It never man. has worked. Because it's a fucking confidence game, just like we've been saying for a long time. And as I've said at several of my speeches and on my podcast, and you've said the same exact thing, we're so many standard deviations away from the norm right now that we don't know what capitulation would even look like from here. We don't know. There is so much debt out there. Wait till these corporate debt bubbles start to pop, right? You're talking about yeah, the supply. it's all junk. There's so much junk. People say, well, but the rates are so low and the junk debt's not a problem. And I said, what happens when the company underneath that debt erodes? Right, right. What happens when the, when the legs of the stool start rotting? That's the problem. And 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 thirty nine percent of the debt is set according to Gundlach. What does he know? I don't know. Right? He's considered the new bond king. If I can't believe Gundlach, then I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Gundlach says thirty nine percent of corporate debt is junk. He says it's not right. rated junk, but it's junk. And and junk debt's supposed to trade for you know nine percent or ten percent or some because these companies are at risk of of taking everything from your sorry hide. Right. And it's trading at nothing. It's trading right. at nothing. Right. And so the bond market's going to be a killing field at some point. If the bond market becomes a killing field, the stock market becomes a killing field. So we've got, and then you got this dumbass Fed model, right? The idiots at the Federal Reserve. <laughs> I always end up calling the Federal Reserve a bunch of idiots, but you, you have the, the Fed model for stock valuations. And they say, well, stock valuations correlate with interest rates. And and it, basically what they're saying is if you have the biggest bond bubble in the known universe in history, you therefore should also have the biggest stock bubble of all time. That's what the Fed model says. It's so unbelievably stupid. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think there are some huge 
unknowns. That inflection point, though, that I've talked about, that you've talked about, when because central banking policy is such a fucking confidence game, what do I talk about with you? What do I talk about with Fleckenstein? What do I talk about on the podcast? When I speak, I talk about getting to this point where people lose confidence in that assurance. You're talking about, hey, maybe we'll get the all clear or maybe Mnuchin will come out and say, all right, well, we're going to inject so-and-so amount of money into so-and-so. What happens when that doesn't matter? When that doesn't alleviate people's fears, then you're going to have a real problem. And we don't even know what normal is, Dave. What's normal? A 50% drop on the Dow? A 30% well, drop? By my, by my math, round numbers, uh, fifty, a little over 50% would get us back to historical normal valuations. Now, you, <clears throat> you can't plummet from 35,000 feet without some organ failure along the way, right? So you, 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 you can't. You couldn't all of a sudden cut the Dow in half or even gradually cut the Dow in half without doing damage, which means therefore the valuations are chasing their own shadow. Well, damage so is... I don't, I don't know where we go from here. Damage is an understanding. And, and let's say hypothetically it never drops. The, so I posted yesterday a, a, a Raul Paul uh, uh, presentation on pension funds from February 10th. And he talked about the pension crisis, and he nailed it. He really nailed it. It's stuff that I've been thinking about, but he put it all together. Such a nice package. And he talks uh, he talks about how people made so much money in their bond funds when they desperately needed it. But now the problem is now the duration risk has finally come home to roost, and now they can't get bonds that give them any return. So while their capital appreciation was was pulling appreciation forward essentially – as those 10 year treasuries roll off and you got to renew them, you get nothing. Next thing you know, you realize you got a, You already got your appreciation. You already got your money. Now you get to buy bonds and return nothing. Right. And so the, that bond bull saved us from the equity bear in 09. But it just, it only saved us temporarily. Yeah. And but, trying so to. So now we have, now we have bond funds that return what, 2%? Probably well, and, and there's still pension funds now, right? You want to talk? You, you want to talk about fucking cascading <laughs> issues on the way down? Get this column. There are pension funds now that this year are issuing bonds, okay, at these super low interest rates to try to take that money and put on some fucking carry trade in the equity markets. I mean, you want to talk about an implosion? Right, all these pension funds yeah. that are now chasing because you can't get yield anywhere but the stock market now, right? Chasing yield. So, in, so this is so so. Find Raul Paul's presentation. It's on YouTube. Your listeners, go find it. He does a beautiful job talking about that. He says we've reached the end of our rope. It's so tough right, now. Right. Right. Yeah. In, in the and he, he he points out that what I've been writing about and talking about where where if if you're only going to get two percent, which doesn't even tie inflation. Right. You've got no earnings from your bond fund, and in a fifty fifty portfolio. By the way, boomer shouldn't be much higher than fifty fifty. There, 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 there's. I, I heard you should have equities. A percentage commitment to equity is roughly in proportion to how many years you have left in your life. Right. So That's a, I've heard that you too. You should have you should have you know eighty percent call it if you want, and then it should shrink from there. Something like that. I, it's a kind of a just a crude estimate, but the fact of the matter is, boomers should be lightening up on the sketchy shit. And if they lighten up now before it goes to hell, but then all of a sudden that's what tanks markets. If they all decide, holy cow, I can retire on what I have. I can't retire on it on any less. Then they're gonna they're gonna start scrambling to get the hell out when they realize that, that there's a real storm coming. We've, and then the, and then the and then you get these huge air pockets like in uh, like in 0809 where all of a sudden people wake up and their hands are shaking as they move the mouse. Right. <laughs> well, we've and we've never been as far from normal and as far from you know probably where actual price discovery should be and would lead us we've never been further off that path than we are now which means for you know we're going to see unprecedented elasticity in the other direction as well the gate is going to swing in the other direction just as far 
as it swung in the first direction. And that's worrisome. And that's, you know, when you have an issue like this, like we're having now, that we really don't seem to have control over, uh, that's worrisome. So then the, so then the question is, um, what, what to, to, to be a buy and holder right now requires that you, um, requires that you assume that, that this bull cannot be stopped by this virus. Right. And it's not that, you know, again, if the market was fair value, I'd say, okay, so we're going to lose a bunch of GDP over the next year or two. Not a problem. Right. But but if you have a metastable system, a house of cards, you don't want people slamming doors in the house. And so you, it's it's a very different situation when the, when when you are in a metastable economic system. Right. And and there's no evidence these Fed guys are omnipotent, right? There's no evidence that they that they have any special skill. All they know how to do is print money, and 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 we've already got an inflation problem that's exactly the opposite of the stupid thing they spout off about. There, I go calling the Feds a bunch of idiots, but I think they are. And. Uh, and, and yeah, in case your readers haven't seen it, the listeners, there's a thing called the Chapwood Index. Search Chapwood, C H A P W O O D, Chapwood Index. It's kind of like shadow stats. They take the biggest 50 cities, they monitor 50 items in the 50 biggest cities. They're running at 10% a year over the last five years. And it sounds high to me, not quite. It, it, it sounds too high to me almost, but at, at the same time, I got a student who's working at Genentech right now. He, just, he got there about two years ago and he lives in the tenderloin. He's stepping over piles of shit. He's stepping over sleeping people to get to work. And uh, he's paying four grand a month. That's that's what four grand a month gets you in San Francisco. So, you know, there really is potential. I don't think there's 10 percent inflation in a place like Ithaca, but in the big cities there could be. And guess where all the people are, the big cities, because that's where the density is. Yeah, it's true. And San Francisco is a great example of, you know, inflated prices and not getting anything for your <laughs> not getting anything wait for your tax the money virus gets into those and you're going wait a minute is this san francisco is this new delhi right the, 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 so san francisco the, the, already the, fucking the looks, looks like new delhi <laughs> you know it, it, it san francisco already looks like it i mean there's people shitting on the streets all over san francisco right it's it's not in good shape san francisco i've been there you know three or four times over the last five or six years and progressively Every time I've been there, I've been accosted by more and more, you know, homeless people, and I've noticed the city deteriorating uh, invisibly. Yeah, three or four years ago, and we were in what looked like a reasonable district, but we went and had dinner, and, and then uh, by the time I came out, it was nothing but hookers and guys screaming at themselves in the streets. And there's so there's it, an argument to be made for that too. <laughs> Yeah, I know. You know that, that's, that's you and I right there. And I and walking the subway screaming about the coronavirus. Sometimes you leave the bar, you know, and you're in that kind of mood, right? Exactly. Exactly. You're, sometimes you're the guy screaming at yourself leaving the bar. We've all been there. I've been there. Well, it's been a long time for me. <laughs> so what, what are you paying attention to going forward? I mean, before uh, – before we end this discussion on the virus, I want to know what what it is specifically that you're looking at. And well, besides the markets and, and whether or not this is the, the big one, whether someone whether someone has whether this thing is irreversibly um, put a lid on animal spirits. Oh, I think it has. And, well, you know, I got I've been wrong before though. So I I find the market so inexplicable now that I to think that I all of a sudden now I think I understand them makes me a little uneasy. Right. Because I I I think the last ten years has been a, a bad farce, and and you have markets. You know, markets are supposed to track GDP, roughly speaking. That's the Buffett model. Right. The markets track GDP, and and the GDP over the last ten years is up about. 30 something percent the market dropped something like 400 percent it seems to me that 400 percent has to be given back and and that means an that's an 80 percent drop right and and uh and oh nine was not a particularly deeply undervalued market it got a little below historical norm but uh the only reason it felt deeply valued uh was because uh 
it was because we had fallen from such lofty positions. We're so used to overvalued markets by historical metrics. Right, right. Maybe historical metrics don't work anymore. Maybe we're in the digital age. But, you know, if I just read something somewhere last year that, that if you take out the – they were called the FAMs. Who who did, came up with that? Or the Feld? Or someone came up with FAMs, you know, Facebook, uh, Apple, whatever. Netflix and um, Google. Fang. You're talking about Fang? Well, Apple, Alphabet, uh so I took out the G, replaced it with an A alphabet, and whatever, you know the stocks. If you take out the, the five big ones, that the earnings of the rest of the S&P last year dropped 4%. Right. <laughs> I, by the way, here, here's something for you. If you look at things like industrial production and stuff like that, I think we had a recession in 15 and 16. I think we had a recession that they were able to hide, which, by the way, kind of nukes my model, because I'm kind of a believer that recessions pull back the curtain. Right. I, I thought we were starting recession and then it never materialized. And I have been seeing stuff. And I'm going, wait a minute, we did have a recession. There's plenty of data that shows industrial production dropping and trucking dropping at, at, at recessionary levels in, in 15, 16. Well, and there's some now and, too. Right. Well, yeah, last year. We, we're hitting this coronavirus into a weakening economy, a weakening global economy. But but if they can paper over this stuff like that, if they can paper over a recession in 15, 16, and not even have to admit to the fact that there was a recession. Right. Then, and and it, it appears to have been a recession where there were, weren't many recorded job losses. So I don't know what that means. I, I get I get lost when they say oh, we're well, like right now they say we're in a trucking recession, we're in an auto recession, we're in a we're in a uh, we're in a rail recession. We, well, we obviously are. are now in a shipping recession. We're in. We're in, we are. Well, how can you have all those recessions and not be in a recession? Well, you're in a recession economically. Just it's not showing up in the stock market, which is why it's so important right. to the delineate the two of them. According to the Wizards of Wall Street, that's supposed to see it coming, and you're supposed to get the flutters before the recession, not after. And it's supposed to actually see the recovery coming in advance. So you're supposed to actually have. You know, market recoveries in the middle of the recession, and, and and what it shows is that what used to be the stock market that was the imitating the wisdom of crowds, where millions of people were collectively somehow sniffing out the answer, is now a very different game. The right. price discovery, to the extent you want to call it that, with the tongue in cheek, uh, is no longer millions of investors sniffing out. You know earnings earnings surprises and things like that it's not that anymore it's no longer like want to be a millionaire where you ask the audience and they always get it right and that's because of the intervention by central banks and they've 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 uh they've put a coin in the fuse box and and they've made it impossible the signals are all whacked out but that, at some point, that coin will melt, or you'll have a house fire. You know, or to take the metaphor to an extreme. Yeah, I mean, we are already in a shipping recession. We are already in an auto recession. I mean, if you look at things like the Cass Fright Index and those things, I mean, they're all showing recessionary signals. Auto has been in a recession for two years almost globally. I mean, now it's just toast. I mean, the auto industry is toast right now. Um, yeah, and the but, loans are extending out to seven years on average and crap like that. So they're doing everything possible. To oh, yeah, they've them. already – they were doing seven-year and eight-year loans, all this crazy shit just to get people in the in the dealerships. But, I mean, auto is screwed. I mean, and shipping more importantly because it's traditionally an indicator of, you know, how the economy is doing um, in general more than autos has also been – you know, if you look at things like – uh, orders for 18 wheelers um, plunged last year and and continue to um, be in recession. I mean, trucking uh, companies are closing down. I've seen headlines of um, you know I, it's just those indicators are there. Again, the economy has been decoupled from the stock market in a way that we don't even we can't even fathom. I mean, uh, well, it's also been. Uh, the other thing that's really so troubling is the decoupling of the bond market from the idea of a revenue stream. Right. And I, I've been laboring over this for several years now, this idea that at one point when you bought a bond, you were buying that revenue stream and you were making a bet 
you know, let's say it was at 5% for 10 years, you're making a bet that 10 years later, 5% will have been a decent deal. And there's nothing, nothing in the bond market that approximates that now. There is no price discovery in the bond market in any normal sense. And the question, whenever I do a podcast, I always ask the person on the other end, which I've already done to you probably three times. So is, you know, how much would you have to be paid if you had to buy a 30 year bond and sit on it? And you couldn't hedge it. You just had to take the revenue. What would, what interest rate would you demand? And it's always a monstrously higher number, which means therefore the price of 30 year bonds is wrong. Now, if 30-year bonds are trading sardines and Pokemon cards and they no longer matter, then so be it. But that means the credit market is broken. Right. And and that's a problem. And, the, you know, I know there's all sorts of crap where you have to sort of balance assets against liabilities in the insurance industry. So it's broken, though. It is broken. And it's broken because they've screwed up the credit market so much that now people are buying 30-year bonds because they want to sell it to some other idiot six months from now. Right. And when, and when I post you like that, there's always tons of people saying, well, you don't hang on to them. And I go, well, then they're not investments, you moron. They're not investments. You're just trading. Po you're playing Pokemon Go with your phone, chasing fucking invisible shit into restaurants. Trying well, to that's, exactly, that's exactly what's going on. I know. That's and exactly that's what's going game, on. That's not a game that that I can play. I don't know about you, but I can't play that game. And then I, people, I then people make a fucking face at you. Treasuries. Then people make a people make a fucking face at you when you want to hold physical gold, like you're an asshole. Then Neil Kashkari goes on Twitter and makes a joke about it. Well, he's an asshole, though. Of course, he's an asshole. He's a huge well, he's asshole. Really, he's, a, he's stunningly ignorant asshole. Of course, I mean, he's an ignorant he, asshole. He, he, but, but he says the stupidest things. Well, that's because he's a he, fucking moron. <laughs> yeah, but you'd think he could fake it. Like when Bullard goes on TV, I think he says the stupidest <laughs> things even when he goes on TV. But but he says them in a way where you go, it's like a politician where you go, okay, that's stupid, but he, he looks good. He's too, he's too <laughs> arrogant to fake it. It's hubris. Yes, Kari doesn't even look good. He says really dumb, dumb, dumb stuff. The kind of stuff where I screen grab it when I see it. For, because I don't want him to delete it, but he's not smart enough to delete the dumb stuff he posts. It's hubris. A, and for those who don't know who Kashkari is, he's the president of Minnesota Fed, right? Jesus Christ Almighty, what kind of clown show is this? <laughs> hubris. It's like you don't even know you're dumb. Like somebody asked me to do some forensic accounting, I'm like, fuck no, I'm terrible at it. I'm gonna go find myself a forensic accountant, and I'll have them do it for me. I don't go, oh, yeah, I'll handle that for you. Just go ahead and give me the numbers and then just, you know, mash a couple of buttons on my desk and turn around and hand them the wrong answer that I know is wrong. You know, that's, so I can't that's, emphasize that's dangerous. enough that your, your listener should go find Raul Paul's second talk. He gives two talks on pensions. And the second one, again, it's not like I learned anything really profoundly new, but somehow he packaged it up in this beautiful, it was like watching a frontline episode on something, you know, how okay. well frontline does. It's just really well done. And then, I, and then after I posted, I posted Grant Williams's uh, treatise on gold, which in my opinion was the best ever argument for owning gold. And so on Twitter, those two are back to back. They're linked, and 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 you know, it's it's and you know now we have all these pension funds that are broke. There's no mechanism to catch. There is no mathematically sound way for the pension funds to catch up. And and then what happens? Well, you end up with social unrest. You end up with crazy time. Yeah, and. Uh... Uh, and here's a question. I like that. I've been thinking, oh, God, I've been grinding my nuts on this one. I've been trying to understand. <laughs> well, I, I've been trying to really understand wealth creation. I know I know what it is in the, in the olden days, right? You build railroads. You build planes. You build cars. Right. You, 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 you make steel. It, Alcoa, General Motors. You had uh, assets, Electric, right? Right. That's wealth creation. You you make life better. You make it. You make things more efficient. You make quality quality of lives improve. Productivity, right? And then I look at the fams or the fangs, whatever you want to call them now, and I I think, what does Facebook do? Right. Now Facebook scrapes data from you in a way that's 
the, to the totalitarian level, except for the fact that I, I can live with the idea that okay, when I go to buy a mattress, Facebook is gonna Facebook is gonna sell. Like I, I looked up uh, something today, and 20 seconds later, I saw an ad for it on Zero Hedge. Right. Yeah. Right. They're fast now. But but that's like putting candy at the checkout line. I don't have to buy it. And if I buy a mattress from Sattva, I'm not going to buy a mattress from Tempur-Pedic. It's a zero-sum game. So Facebook scraping all this data and selling this data to retailers who are trying to sell shit to me. But it's that's not wealth creation. That's that's just that's a, a zero-sum game. There's no net gain in there unless there's unless somewhere there you can find efficiency like. Uh, Right. Like somehow, you know, it's easier to buy from Amazon than it is to go to the store, which, by the way, I'm not buying a mattress offline ever again, online ever again. Uh, but 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 it, there's slivers, slivers of wealth creation the, the the faith, you know, the the buying from Amazon is nice. But that's not like when they invented washing machines. Right. They invented lawnmowers. They invented planes and trains. It's, not, it's nothing in that. And when they started pumping oil out of the ground for 10 cents a barrel, the, there's no wealth creation compared to that stuff. And so, so, so at some point, Facebook's got to hit some asymptotic limit where they scrape right. the data and, and, and and now you have the situation where the companies that can buy that day to get to sell you the mattress. And so all the other minor mattress players go out of business. That's not wealth creation. I, it's, it, it's, it, and Google, I give it wealth creation because, you know, I can look up stuff on the, on timescales that are breathtakingly short compared to what it would have taken before. So if I want to know something about the coronavirus, I can find it fast. And I don't have to go to some library or something. And so there's efficiency there. But there's a whole bunch of these things, Facebook, Twitter, you know, Netflix, you know, brings you shit to watch. But uh, it, is it is it that different than a TV? The freaky thing is when you talk to somebody on the phone, like I call my mother and I say, hey, I'm in the mood for uh, I'm at the supermarket. I'm getting a couple of sweet potatoes or something and then you come home and log on to your Facebook and there's an ad for sweet potatoes and you never even looked at it on your computer has that happened to you yeah, yet? That, that, that's a that, real that, fucking that, thing they're listening to you oh, no yeah. question. that's true oh, yeah. and, and it, what, the, the million dollar question will be on that it's creepy and, and if you I once saw a Stasi guy get an interview and he said if you think they're going to collect the data and not use it against you you're delusional but if they really do just use it to try to sell you sweet potatoes that's not a dystopian future, right. right? That's a that that's just more efficiently. Fine. Oh yeah, I should. Oh, don't forget sweet potatoes. Thanks for reminding me. But 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 if 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 they use it to raise your insurance premium. So so in this book, uh, surveillance capitalism, the, the chick emphasizes um, the certainty. She talks about how they're, they're the sort of the goal is the ultimate certainty. So they know so much about you that they know exactly how risky you are as a driver. So when you're driving, right. depending on the car, supposedly, they know how aggressively you brake. They know whether you're using your blinker. They know whether you're running red lights, stuff like that. Uh, do you really want to live in that world? Is that, does that make anyone's life better? Right. I don't think so. It makes, makes insurance companies a little more efficient. But at great cost, I find it stifling. To, you know, it, it's like as a kid. What, what about if when you grew up, you could never get away with anything? Right. Ah, would you? Would you? Would you mature in the same way that you no. do by learning these hard knocks lessons and of going out and shit face and throwing up your guts and saying, "I better not drink so much next time," right? And and so I, I I'm this is not wealth creation to me. And so I, I you know Apple makes phones they suck now. I've got a comp a new a new Mac Air, and I've had it for about six months. And already three of the keys are becoming illegible from use. Now it's probably from one finger tweeting, <laughs> furiously at some bot. But uh but but the keys are wearing out. The the, the, the they're they're crappy machines now. 
And so the question is, is you know, so now they're a commodity. Well, they're not a. And one of the. I could live with an Apple three uh, with a phone. I don't. I, I don't need the new shit except for they make me get it. So it's a, it's a, it's really more about inflation than, than wealth creation. It's you know I said on a past podcast there's something you know. Uh, Productivity, as you describe it, and kind of the natural order of things, evolution, and the natural order of just, you know, the world as we know it, they run parallel. You know, creating those inefficiencies, it's almost, uh, it's, it's almost like a product of nature. It's, you know, it's very similar to evolution, right? It's, evolution happens on a natural level, but it also happens in the world of computing, right? And I think... One of the comparisons I made on a podcast a couple of weeks ago that I did was that, you know, it's not normal for obviously it's not normal for the market to always go up and for markets to always go up and for people to think that there's no risk. And, you know, obviously, I think it's a bad thing what central bankers are doing, but but it's really it goes against the natural order of just things in general outside of the world of finance. Well, that gets back to the idea that that, that complex systems evolve in a Darwinian way. And you can't you can't engineer a complex system. It has to evolve. And people will say, well, yeah, yeah, wait a minute. We invented a car. No, we didn't. Actually, right. there was a vast amount of trial and error. Same with microchips, same with everything else. Yeah, we started we with a wheel, car, right? We didn't get the cars today by some guy sitting down with blueprints and drawing out a car and saying, oh, I bet this mother's going to work really well. <laughs> we did it by just relentlessly making things like right. axles and Corvairs and, 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 and relentlessly improving <laughs> in microscopic ways. So the, the Hayekian Darwinian evolution model of economics plays out in, in any complex system. Right. Any complex system, and and if we try to remove the culling of the mistakes, then the system's broken, and that's what we're attempting to do. We're attempting to to, to bring absolute certainty where it just isn't supposed to exist. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and we're gonna get fucking smacked for it too. Well, we are gonna get smacked, and, and it's like uh, what's the analogy? Sexual revolutions are always stopped by disease. <laughs> That's when you think you can bang anything that moves, all of a sudden you go, oh, but I better not. <laughs> so it, 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 it happens all the time. So, you know, globalization, same thing. We were right, globalizing yeah. our ass off yeah, in 1913. Exactly. 1913, yep. oh, we, were, we had ships that could sail across the ocean in just a few days yep. and stuff like that. And what do we do? We beat the shit out of each other in World War One. Yeah. And so, so globalization has this natural self-limiting thing, and maybe this is it. Maybe this is the blow-off top of globalization. Look at Brexit, you know? Look Brexit, at Brexit, yeah, and Trump being elected. Right, and, and right. It's not Trump birdie, right? What a colossal mess we're in. If you had told me, if you had told me 10 years ago that, the, that one of the leading candidates, remember when Kennedy was elected, people didn't think he could be elected because he was Catholic. Right. Like, what, a cra what a crazy world that seems in retrospect. <laughs> now you got a guy, a 75-year-old Jewish guy who's a socialist, is, a running, is in the running for the presidency, and you go, What? I mean, I thought there were enough anti-Semites out there to keep that from happening, and 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 now, and, and the socialists. What's with socialism? Uh, you know, five years ago was was some back burner loony bin, right? It right. Was, it was just nothing about socialism was going to sell. Yep. And now we've got a bunch of socialists. And, oh, do we go with Buttigieg socialists or Bernie Sanders socialists wow. or Elizabeth Warren socialist? right? Well, it looks like Bernie's going to get it. People don't even understand what socialism is. That's the problem. People don't understand. They hear the word democratic in front of socialism. They're like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's and a democracy, good, right. Yeah, exactly. That's a but euphemism. Pe people for, don't get it, for... though. They don't know what socialism is they don't understand the history of what socialism has done versus capitalism and they're just grossly misinformed yeah, here's not the unlike the fucking so, stock market so am i going to be surprised when the whole thing goes to shit of course not and this is one of the things raul got to in his podcast the capitalist blew it the capitalists got greedy as hell. Yeah, yeah. Instead of letting so, the market so work, the, the right? The quest for profit, the quest for CEO stock options, the the unlock shareholder value crap. You know how you unlock shareholder value? You run a company such that twenty years from now it's it's made a lot of money. 
That's that's unlocking shareholder value. Yeah, you don't that's bankrupt it price. to buy back stock so you well, can not, cash out your It's not your getting houses. the price to go up. That's not unlocking value. That's pump and dump shit. Right. And so, so, so capitalists have completely blown it. And I don't know, maybe it's like uh, the slime mold that has no brain and it just gets slimy and takes over. You know, the, the fungus in your bathroom. It's not like it's trying to make your bathroom unlivable, but it's doing a fine job maybe. And so you have to bleach it out occasionally. And so maybe, maybe capitalism has to occasionally go through one of these purges where where it it, it 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 just goes into great excess. And I I think it has, and, and it, it does. Capitalism doesn't go into great excess because of free market capitalism. It goes into great excess because it commandeers the machinery of government. So it's big government tied to big capitalism that produces the wad of big crap. Right. And, and so I don't blame capitalism in its purest sense for what we've got now. This is just crony crap. Ow. What the fuck was that? Oh, God. I just banged my leg right into the goddamn desk. Jesus. This is why I can't drink beer when I'm doing these podcasts. I do stupid shit. You'd think I'd be all right to sit here and just mind my own business at my desk and have a conversation without hurting myself. But that's what well, I would did. Would you zip something in your fly or what? Uh, what no, no, it's not that bad. You would have. And what were you, you doing heard before a, you did that? You would have heard a yell. Nothing. I was just spinning around in my chair. I was trying to spin around so I could talk into the microphone because I was I was listening to you whispering sweet nothings about the end of the world to me. I was facing the other direction, and then I spun yeah, back. I'm trying and I to just, make you hot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Love it. All right, Colm, Listen, man. Given the uh, given the circumstances, and uh, and everything that we've covered, uh, you got anything else that you want to touch on before we call it a day? I mean, I know we haven't talked in a while, but I wanted to get all the coronavirus stuff out of the way. Uh, yeah, I wanted to get I, we your just scratched the surface, probably. But uh, but uh, uh, so if I if I have a sense I'm going to croak, this is so so. I'm turning my password over to Rudy Havenstein. There you go. I'm gonna I'm gonna have him tweet from heaven. <laughs> so I'm gonna say, Rudy, I think I'm going right. If I had you know stage four liver cancer, so I'd, I'd say, okay, here's my password, Rudy. Here, here's 50 or 60 tweets that would be fun. Right. You know, talking about lobster and uh, you know and 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 uh, and I I you know shot hoops with Kobe yesterday and you know shit like that and uh, <laughs> and and, uh, and and by the way you know uh, 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 McCain is nowhere in sight right <laughs> <laughs> shit like that and, uh, and and have tweets from heaven and then probably have some mechanism by which my family can say enough is enough <laughs> right right <laughs> but uh, that would that would be my legacy is is, is that would be really cool in case, Although uh, I wouldn't get to watch it, so that would be the shame of it all. Yeah, um, well, you know, who knows? Who, but but who I knows? Also, by the way, as this thing comes, you really ought to be looking at your affairs a little bit. If it's a one in thirty croak rate, you better make sure you tell your family where you know where your will is, right? And where you buried the gold in your garden if you're if you're a midnight gardener and shit like that. Um, you, you do you do not want to be. Uh, you, I, I think it's time to. Uh, it's not to say you're writing your last will and testament. It's to say just take just a hard look sure at things. That, yeah, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to take a hard look and there say, you okay, go. if That's I a nice you know, had all it. the chats, you know, have I have I got a, a living will? Have I got you know various things in place? Because we procrastinate on that shit. I saw him fix the cabinet that I got to fix in my house. Yeah, and, the, uh, and and you know, not that I need to fix that thing, but. Uh, Especially if I go, I gotta outlive my wife though. I don't want to leave her on her own. Doesn't seem fair. Um, so I gotta outlive her. But uh, but but after that, then it's like take me, fuck it. You know, I, I, I don't. There, there's there's. Uh, I've had a good time. It's been a great run. When uh, when all is said and done, I mean, if you look, how old are you now? Sixty four. All right, so you're 64. When you look back on your 64 years, and I'm not asking you this because I think you're going to die, but just because it just came yeah, to right. mind just, as we're on this conversation. I mean, what do you idea. think? When you look back on your 64 years, oh, like what do you? I've what do you made the, decisions that I wouldn't regret? What are you I, proud I've of? Always, I've had various cardinal rules that say don't, don't, don't make don't make bad decisions and here's how not to make bad decisions and so like when i did the real vision interview with um with tony greer 
I, I convey this. I said, when I make a big decision, I ask the question I always run that decision through is if, if, if this decision lead turns out to be really, really wrong, will I forgive myself? And that's how I decide whether to buy Bitcoin. And that's how I decide right. whether to stay invested. That's how I decide whether to get married, whether to have kids and, you know, the real biggies. I say, well, I forgive myself. And, and if I find myself going, nah, you know, you'd be kicking yourself pretty fucking hard on that decision, then don't do it. Right. And so, uh, so no, I've had a, I've had a phenomenal life. So I, I, someone once asked, you know, what are your regrets? I have no regrets. God damn it. I partied as a kid. I didn't pay for any dear prices. I have no, un, you know, I have no child support that I know of, you know, anything like that. And, uh, and you know, my kids are doing fine. And, and, uh, and, uh, what are you proudest I'm not of? Gonna, what's that? What are you proudest of? Uh, in, in, in seventh grade my seventh grade soccer team beat the eighth graders in the championship game playing two men down. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck those eighth graders. <laughs> um, what am I proudest of? You know, I probably, I don't know if it's what I'm proudest of, but the, but, but the achievement that I would, that would is trivia, trivially the answer to that would be the PhD. I, I, I got a PhD in two and a half years. Wow. And, and that's a that's just a fucking amazing, a bizarre thing. Especially since I wasn't even a great student. It was just all that was all just balls to the wall, you know, grinding out and humongous amounts of luck. Right. And and everything before that and after that and what I did to get it was such a one in a hundred thing where three of us did something scientifically that just blew the socks off everyone. So so I got unsolicited job interviews. What was it? What did you do? Uh, we made a really big, hairy, complex molecule that no one would have believed we could make in 14 months. And so I found myself getting offers to interview for jobs um, at the beginning of my third year of grad school. Now, most people spend five years in grad school and two or three years in the postdoc. So this is, this is just so far ahead of anything rational. And I wasn't the phenomenal student. I worked very hard in grad school, but you know, it wasn't like I was some Ashkenazi Jew with a brain the size of a watermelon or anything like that. And uh, and and so that was the equivalent. That was my equivalent of you know beating the Russians in hockey. Right. Yeah. Hell yeah. And and it was for me, it was of that magnitude, and I couldn't ever do it again. And it influenced my career choice because I realized that if I, my career will have peaked if I don't do something fairly different right and so i did so i, I kind of moved on to other things but that that would have to be the, the sort of the more most breathtaking proud moment i think um and and the fact that i'm still scientifically on my feet after 40 fucking years yeah that's hard to do because it, there's darwinian pressures in this game too you, sure you you to keep yourself funded to keep it to just keep in, it in academia moving. right in general yeah it's like it's, it's the equivalent of running a restaurant for 40 years right right it's, it's 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 one of those where you go boy that's pretty good um and so uh and so the fact that i'm, I'm funded till i'm 69 so i so i didn't drop the ball that, good that i'm pretty proud of and you know there's other shit i did i was pretty good in taekwondo and I coach two collegiate sports. How's that? Um, there's there's things along the way. My my life has been filled with with you know. There's a movie with Joe Pesci and Brandon Fraser, and it's uh oh Brandon Fraser. He writes his master's thesis at Harvard, and he leaves it somewhere, and Pesci finds it. And he's a bum, and the two are joined at the hip throughout the fucking movie. And and uh, but at one point, Fraser says to uh, uh, Pesci says that's my life and Pesci looks at him and says that's pathetic and Pesci pulls a bag out of his pocket and there's stones in it and he pours them into his hand and he, he says whenever I do something that's important I pick up a stone and he says he, he says uh, he picks up one out of his palm he says this is my when my youngest son was born and he says this is when I got married and he picks up another. He says, "This was a woman in Bimini, right?" To get a little bit of a laugh, but but the metaphor of of picking up stones to me was really a moving one. Yeah. And so uh, through the years, you know, and I this, I write about this, right? So when I get in a brawl with the American Federation of Teachers and single-handedly kick the fuck out of them, single-handedly knocked over their two million dollars. A unionization effort because I was able to to brawl them in public and win. 
I, things like those are fun moments, right? Yeah, hell yeah. I asked. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, and I, I did some collegiate sports myself. So there's just shit along the way. And, and I can't think of anything I fucked up royally. Maybe maybe this podcast, who knows? <laughs> but, but here I am talking about, right? I, it, what a what a weird world, right? What a, we're, we're, I was talking to some guy yesterday who cold called me. He's a he's a, a lawyer, and he just cold called me and said, "I want to chat." And and uh, you know, I get to talk with such smart people. I've said yeah. the podium. It's so much fun. And and you know, I can spend two hours on the phone talking to some guy who's running a nuclear power plant. In my brain, I wake up in the morning, I turn on the computer, I turn it off at about one o'clock in the in the in the morning, and uh, it just goes all day on all sorts of crazy shit. And uh, it's a good life. And I live in a nice house overlooking the lake, seeing sunsets every night, except in the winter. Well, I see them too, but um, so uh, no, no complaints. How about you? What? Wait, answer the question that you just asked me. What am I most proud of? Yeah, uh, that is a that's a good question. I think uh, I think you know I came to the realization that uh, I don't know maybe ten years ago or twelve years ago that you know my family and I because it's just me, my mom, my dad, my family and I we had kind of made it through a lot of uh, well my adolescence and growing up where you know I did some dumb shit and. Uh, but we we made it through kind of all of that, and and I said to my parents at one point, you know, we're, we've solved a lot of the big problems that uh, we had as a family, and right. the only thing that we have left to do is just hang out now, you know, like we we hang. I see my parents all the time, you know, we hang out. We're we're very very close. We're good friends as well as uh, family members, and we laugh all the fucking time. And I think that. You know, come into that realization some years back that like, all right, like this is cool. Like now we just hang out, and we just love each other, and that's it. You know, that's like the so meaning. That's, it's so like the meaning I of life. You know, job candidates. I often ask a job candidate, and they're these young, fire breathing, glass chewing. Yeah. You know, when we interview someone, they they are one of the top. You know, five in the world of right. what they do in their age bracket, and I said, "What's your what's your number one goal?" And they sit there and grind and grind and grind. And at the end, I said, "It's to be happy." Right. That's it. Yeah. That's it. And the rest is just goddamn a vehicle to get there. That's so you, you ever see somehow that? Somehow you don't recognize that, then you'll go your whole life somehow saying, you know, at some point I will let myself be happy. Right. Well, that point will never come unless you let yourself be happy. <laughs> Which means when you get a victory, stop and savor the victory. Right, yep. And and enjoy the victories that come after the defeats and things like that. Yeah. And embrace embrace the defeats too. That's another, right. you know, kind of Buddhist tenant that I that I follow. You know, you gotta you gotta take the medicine. You gotta take the pain when shit goes wrong. It Well it's... that's what I used to like about Taekwondo is I'd come home at night and I'd be beat to shit. Yeah, yep. And I'd have bruises on my ribs and stuff, depending on who I sparred. And, and I'd sit there and soak in the tub, and I'd be just so happy. Yeah. Oh, just so totally. happy. I just, because I could feel it, right? I could feel the pain. And at the same time, you know, it, it, it was very real. So, oh, that's, it's, and, look, and, I feel know, this. And then and it turns out one of the guys he used to spar, I used to beat. And then, and then, and then he got better than me. Just flat out raced by me. But at one point, I could whip his ass. <laughs> and then he raced by me, and and uh, and he lost seven to four to the gold medalist in the Athens Olympics. Oh wow! And I go, that's cool, right? You know, and I, I played lacrosse for a while in high school, and then dropped out because I I, I was small, and I I really loved gymnastics, and I was I said I'm not good, I'm not that good at lacrosse. I was starting, but I, I there was a there was a southpaw. Who, who I was the only ambidextrous guy back then. Back in the old days, people played one hand, and I, I was naturally both hands. And my brother used to say, how, "What, what, how, what hand did you score the goals with today?" And I, I'd say, "I don't know. I don't remember." And um, and uh, and there's this south post just clearly better than me. And and uh, and then there's this, this defenseman who I used to have to practice against, and he just brutalized the shit out of me. There's another defenseman, no problem, but this one defenseman was just rough on me. And so I, I went, I went over to back to gymnastics full, you know, 12 months a year. Right. 
gave up the lacrosse. I didn't like lacrosse at all, the, the way I like gymnastics. It's just it's how I was wired. And and then and then and then later on I find out the Southpaw who was better was a three time first team All American at Syracuse. The defenseman was the long snapper for the Cowboys for twelve years. And I'm going, you know, it might have been nice to know that. <laughs> Maybe, no, it's, maybe be, it's better to maybe not. Maybe I wouldn't have been so tough on myself as lacking potential. Better to not and the, know. The other defenseman I said, who I said was not relevant. I don't even remember having to practice against him. He played for Georgetown. He was no slouch. I just had no idea. I was surrounded by phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. Dude, talent. it's it's better to not know that shit. I just went to a right, gym- it's, but I love the gymnastics, so I don't regret that either. That decision was made. You know, the way I said, I just decided I'd rather do gymnastics than, I, uh, than play lacrosse. I just uh, yeah. I just competed a couple of months ago in a jiu-jitsu tournament. And, you know, I had just gotten uh, my blue belt in jiu-jitsu. And it was my first time competing at the blue belt level. And I made the mistake of looking up who my opponents were going to be because they give you the, uh, you know, they give you the right. tournament schedule ahead of time. And, you know, the the one guy that I had gone against was slated to go against that I was concerned about was, you know, I'd been a blue belt for like six years or something ridiculous and owned his own MMA gym and was an amateur MMA fighter. And he was like, you What's know, the highest the, belt in jujitsu bl- black belt. Okay. Yeah. So it goes white, blue, purple, brown, black. Um, okay. But um, I psyched myself out, you know, and it's somebody that I know on a, on a good day I could have hung with and, and I got my ass kicked. But uh, the mistake was going and looking that up, ahead of time like I don't care if you're an Olympian I don't care if yeah, you're you know, that's whatever like, true. I, you know I, I know if I'm having a good day I can catch you right I gotta be having a very good day but uh, you know when people say oh don't worry you know he was he, he's way more experiencing you way more this way more that I said, it doesn't shouldn't fucking matter you know you should go in with the expectation to win so I'm never right. doing that again I'm never looking I, I completely mind fucked myself for the entire tournament uh, but one thing I do love also about jujitsu that you just mentioned is when you when you come home and you just got your ass beat. I mean, you just gotten strangled and choked and wrist locked and shoulder locked and leg locked and heel hooked and just the absolute shit kicked out of you for three hours. And then you and come home and you take. Can be. Oh man, it's like pure euphoria, man. What a beautiful feeling. That's that's exactly right. I don't know what it was, but I, you know, and I used to spar against the Cornell kids all the time. We used to debate about who enjoyed beating on whom more so it's, it's being a professor and getting to beat on undergrads or being undergrads and getting to beat on a professor right and uh and we we all just loved it and uh and i used to love refereeing i used to do like 12 hour referee stints for things like the the, the the new england championships and the various various ecacs and shit like that and uh and uh, and I just loved it. I could be out there for twelve straight hours. At the end of the day, I had nothing left. That, it's exhausting refereeing for twelve hours. And um, but I just God, that those that was a great decade. That was a great decade for me. And, and you know, some of my best friends were undergrads. And uh, and and I used to go drinking with them and stuff back when I drank some. Um, did more keg stands than the average professor. Uh, and and. And some of these guys are now pros. They're they're professional taekwondo. They own their own uh, own, own clubs and stuff. And, and uh, the guy I used to train with, he he's now an eighth degree eighth don. It's called to get trained to get to eighth don. They send people from Korea. You, know, you don't just get that one, right? And uh, you get I, I don't even know what it is. It sounded like it was really physical. I, I kind of would have thought eighth down would be how much uh, you know how much beer you can drink or something. But, uh, <laughs> I just I went to Vegas in October and uh, trained out there at a gym called uh, Alliance. The people were very very nice people. It was a wonderful place to train. Very competitive and uh, and I'm out there training. You know, in jujitsu, what you do you go you warm up you drill for. You know, usually an hour, and then you right. spar for about an hour, right? That's that about right. the general yeah. gist of things. And uh, so as I'm working with this guy that is there, and we're working on our drilling, you know, he keeps saying to me, hey, you know, uh, when when we go to spar, you got to go with this kid, Liam, across the room. And, uh, and I look over, and you know, there's this young kid. He looks like he's like 16, maybe 17, uh, you know, just... 
generally unassuming looking person, maybe like weighs maybe 150, 155, you know, maybe oh, five, yeah. maybe 510, you know, I'm, I'm 6'2", 200. And he keeps saying this as we're chilling, you know, hey, make sure you go with Liam. Make sure you go with this guy too, but make sure you also go with Liam. Man, eh, this, that, and the other. And uh, so we get done drilling and then we go, we start going live. We start getting live matches and me and the guy I'm drilling with, we're going and, you know, we're, we're going good. He taps me, I tap him, this, that, and the other. Everybody's right. happy. You know, nothing crazy. And then, uh, you know, three or four matches later, uh, he kind of like pushes me over to me. He says, go, go train with this kid, Liam. So I said, all right, man, how, how you doing? You know, whatever. And, and right. this kid just absolutely mangled me. And I mean, fucking mangled me. It was, and and I'm telling you, Dave, you know, there's certain, sometimes I go with higher belts and even if I'm getting tapped all the time, there's certain positions that I can get into where I feel like, okay. Well, there's I, also kind of an etiquette, right? So you get well, up the belt ranks and you don't go beating on, well, on lower ranks. Yeah, but, but also, but also I get, you know, when you, when I have 50 pounds on them and I'm, and I'm several feet taller than I'm in, I'm well, a blue to, belt. I'm I used to a, spar a 240 pound pig farmer. Well, wow. you're six foot five and holy crap. Let me finish the story real quick. So I go over, I start sparring with this kid and like there is etiquette. You tap, you know, then you let go. It's it's it. So it's just one boom, boom, boom. And in a in a six or seven minute round, I think he tapped me probably ten times with ten different things, which is just mind boggling. And uh and so I I left and inadvertently somehow found him on Instagram at one point through like the Alliance site or whatever, but he's he was the IBJJF, you know, worlds gold medalist i think for his age group and for his belt and when you when you go from being a um a kid to the adult class in jiu-jitsu you no matter how long you've been training you automatically go to a blue belt uh if you've been training for a certain amount of time you won't go and it's not like you can come out of kids and then get your brown belt or your black belt immediately generally what happens is you automatically get a blue belt and so this kid had probably been training his whole life, whatever, but he was so good. But the ass whooping I got felt fucking great when I was the whole, this is the whole point of the story. You know, it was just when you, a lot of people would be like, ah, oh, man, I can't believe I just got this. It was just such a good feeling. I was like, it's so humbling. And there's something that just feels so great. about. It's like why I take cold showers too. It's so the, here's the deal. I want to get an I want to get an interview with Joe Rogan and you should want to get a sparring match with Joe Rogan. Oh, I'd, I'm, I'd love to I'm with done. You. I'm over the hill. I'm a fat old fuck at this point. <laughs> I, you know, I, and I, it's 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 my 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 most natural skill appears to be getting old and fat. But uh, but 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 uh, you know, Rogan Rogan would be a killer. I don't know if you've seen. Rogan's he's a bad motherfucker. Kick. Yeah, he's a he bad has dude. A bad back kick. Yeah, he's got a very powerful back kick, and it was my favorite kick too. But I look at his and I go, I don't think I can break crap the way he can break crap. <laughs> but, uh, but so, so my goal, my bucket list, podcasting wise, no offense, but I've already checked you off, so that you don't have to take, take offense. Um, would be to get a Rogan podcast. And You'll get I've, on there. I've watched. I've watched tweeters say. Uh, you know, you got you got to have Colum on something. You know, some one of these days he's going to see one of those and maybe take it seriously. Um, but that that would be that would, that would be for for podcasting. That would be it. I will have checked all the boxes. Well, I think uh, he, that is like that's the holy grail, right? And if you're a listener and you got two grail. degrees of separation to uh, Rogan, make sure you get a uh, make sure you. Well, I have get... one degree because we're we're on a mutual follow, so th there is there is a connection there. But, okay. Uh, I mean, I've, I've had a few DMs with him, but uh, I haven't figured out a way to say Joe. Would you oh, he follows fly? you. Yeah. Oh, I, awesome. <laughs> I, I, I figured out how to say Joe, fly me out. I want to, I'll fly myself out for Christ's sakes. I right. want to do a podcast. Right, right. And, oh, that's uh, so cool. You'll get you out look there. Look at the, the quality of his, no, 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 the, he's, he's way up there. You know, he's interviewing presidential candidates and stuff. Who now. gives a, you're a fucking presidential candidate. Who cares? Yeah, right. Just, just no one knows it. Exactly. I've thrown my hat into the ring. I, I could beat, uh, I, I could beat uh, uh, Biden. The last time <laughs> I talked to my mother about you, when I was with my mom and my dad going to lunch, my mom actually said, I would vote for Dave Collum. She said that like un, unprovoked. Okay, that makes about two people. <laughs> so in any case, I gotta let you go. All my right, Colin. waiting for me. I'll, I think I'll stop and start buy some bags of rice. You got it, yep. <laughs> 
and uh, and I'll I'll see you later. When does this thing go up tonight? Yeah, about five minutes. As soon as I can get all this okay. shit done, and then uh, I can go about okay. my evening. But listen, thanks so much for coming on. And listen, you got a lot of love for me, and I know you got a lot of love for my listeners. So. Uh, yeah, I'd like to thank the five of you who are still on the line. <laughs> oh, yeah. And that's how I feel, too. <laughs> Adios, guys. Have All right. fun. Buy Bitcoin. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Those guys are like Bible thumpers. Show up at the door. With, I love you guys, but you, you show up at the door with what your did, Bible and your suits trying to get me to convert. It's not going to happen. Dennis Leary, Dennis Leary I'm on, one of his, uh, on one of his uh, – comedy specials. He said, make sure you get your whole head in front of the shotgun, okay? Thank you very much. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Oh, that's a good one. I gotta write that one down. I can use everything. I'm like a, I'm like a, I'm like a rural Chinese guy. I can eat everything. <laughs> uh, Alright, Colin. Later. Yeah, we'll touch fun. base soon, buddy. Speak to you soon. Bye. All right, that was the one. Oh, shit. I, I cut him off. He was saying bye there if you didn't hear the last thing. But anyways, Dave Collum, the one, the only. Awesome to have him back on. And, uh, man, I got shit to do. So I'm out of here. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks again to my patrons for supporting me. Let's get Colum on Joe Rogan, please, for fuck's sake. And I will be back very soon. I got a queue of people lined up for podcasts. And if all hell keeps breaking loose... I suppose I might have one or two things to say about that as well, but I appreciate your continued listens and your patrons. For right now, I'm the fuck out. Peace! Oh, I gotta get liquored up before the Democratic debate. I can't wait. Maybe I'll live tweet it. Peace! <laughs>